Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the first Turnips Digest of the year of our Lord, 2023. And uh, I might say we are inaugurating it today with a uh, very, very uh, expert uh, opinion on the subject matter. Um, but before we get into introducing our guests um, and, you know, kicking this off uh, nice and quick like, um, I might remind everyone that if you like what is happening here, uh, the link to support is in the description, um, as well as Super Chats, uh, which are now open. Um, however, uh, the subscribe star that is in the description, uh, always much better than the Super Chats. Uh, however, both will eventually be read. Um, on top of that, um, you can see the rest of our links in the description here, mine and my guests. And uh, yeah, we should have a lot more uh, subjects uh, coming up this, uh, this year. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Prudentialist and I have talked about going over some of the uh, paleoconservative uh, political writings from the last century and some of their forebears. Um, Panama Hat and I have a lot of historical topics lined up to do with Europe and South America and uh, the other parts of the world that he is good with. Um, I have a couple of uh, potential uh, conversations lined up with uh, completely uh, different people that have yet to be on. Uh, some people from the Mises Institute, like Tho Bishop. Uh, we have, uh, I've talked with uh, Frodi Mjorg uh, to uh, do a uh, discussion, perhaps on the younger generations or the older alt-right, something along those lines. All of those things are uh, lined up for this year. Um, it's looking to be uh, very, uh, <clears throat> very uh, interesting to me, very fun, uh, very, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully teaching. Uh, hopefully everyone learns a lot. So with all that being said, Mr. Grant Brooks, how are you? Doing well. How about yourself? <laughs> I'm doing all right. Uh, I have a little bit of allergies, so um, I might if I suddenly uh, mute myself or uh, cut myself off or something, uh, I might be a sneeze or a cough or whatnot. Um, yeah, I've, you probably have enough acumen to just carry on uh, or pick up, fill dead air, uh, whatever goes on. <laughs> we'll figure something out. Yeah, so... Um, Mr. Brooks, you are joining me uh, to talk about Presbyterianism in America, and uh, for people that don't really just know American history, uh, that might sound like a bit of a random, a random uh, curiosity, you know, the Presbyterians in America, because if you look out today at the American uh, religious landscape, um, you'll see a lot of Roman Catholics, you'll see a lot of Southern Baptists. Um, if you live in America, you'll know a lot of people that just say they're non-denominational, um, if you're in the Northeast, you might see some of the weirder types, uh, Unitarians, uh, uh, Universalists, all these other things. If you go out West, you'll see Mormons, uh, which most Christians won't consider Christian, but are uh, nevertheless a regional majority. Um, you'll know some of the crazy branches uh, that a lot of people outside of the U.S. Uh, think are absolutely insane. Uh, Pentecostals uh, are an enigma to most people living outside of the U.S. and South America. Um, so Presbyterianism, uh, much like some of the other older religious denominations in America, like say the Episcopalians, um, some of the older Lutherans, uh, which had a, uh, influence on the founding of the country, uh, has fallen slightly by the wayside, um, at least in sort of the, uh, national consciousness, but they're actually very, very important to the founding of the country and its history, um, as I'm sure Mr. Brooks will prove. And uh, in case you don't believe me, I'm going to rattle off a short list of famous American Presbyterians to kind of uh, give people an idea. These aren't going to be, you know, nitty gritty details, just big names, um, just so that you can kind of see that they aren't just nobodies if you haven't heard of them yet. Um, so just a very easy, gentle one, uh, you know, John Wayne, the actor movie star, the very famous one, John Wayne. Uh, we have Mark Twain, the uh, American satirist and author and journalist. Uh, that everyone loves to, uh, to quote. Um, we have a slew of presidents, uh, ranging from uh, Andrew Jackson to uh, James Buchanan right before the Civil War. Uh, we have Woodrow Wilson, uh, the, the Woodrow Wilson that most people will know about. We have William Jennings Bryan, the populist candidate and later Secretary of State under Wilson. Uh, we have uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, Donald Trump. Um, you know, we have quite a lot of uh, very famous uh, Presbyterians. There's Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, Andrew Carnegie, the uh, famous industrialist, uh, Ross Perot, the uh, third party candidate uh, that uh, most people still might have a grudge against to this day. Uh, all of those people 
are Presbyterians. And as you'll show, Mr. Brooks, if you go back to literally any point in United States history, there's always a good bit of Presbyterianism there towards the top of the country kind of shaping the national uh, direction. So, you know, it's not like we just picked a random uh, church and said, let's focus on this and a uh, random location like, say, America. Um, this is actually key to understanding the development and the character of the country. So, uh, Mr. Brooks, I uh, believe you are now the uh, now going to be the presenter because this is uh, something that you know far more than I do. Yes. So I myself am a Presbyterian, and you're very right to point out that Presbyterianism in modern America is numerically very small. I think there's probably at max five million of them now. They're just, they're not, there aren't very many of them. But if you look at Presbyterianism historically, it's one of these denominations and one of these keys that's like a foundational piece of America in the sense that so much of the key things that are happening in America or key political leaders or such, Presbyterians are almost always involved, at least in some way. I mean, even the list of the presidents, if you go down and basically cross out Presbyterians and Episcopalians, you're going to cross out at least half of our presidents, if not probably a little bit more than that. So it's it's one of these things that that bears a lot, a lot of its imprint on this country, even though it's it's actually pretty small. Right. And and as as we uh, said, and as you'll later go on to our uh, show, you know, it wasn't small once upon a time. It's just uh, uh, they have a uh, they, they have a way of, uh, you know, working themselves into the uh, more respectable positions in the United States, probably because, you know, they built half of them. Um, you'll see that uh, if you go through a list of American governors throughout time, so a giant list, uh, governors, senators, representatives. <clears throat> electors, um, you know, any sort of uh, prestigious position in the United States, you'll see that half the list, if not far more, is going to be Anglicans or Episcopalians and Presbyterians, uh, which, um, as we covered in our stream uh, a few months ago when we were talking about the uh, sort of uh, Scot the Scottish Reformation and basically the birth of Presbyterianism, um, those two are kind of connected. Uh, so when you look at the United States and its founding, uh, focusing on this, uh, you know, the remnant of the Church of England and then the Presbyterians, uh, it, it will help people understand uh, why people thought the way they did uh, earlier on, uh, what the goal was, what their uh, ideals and philosophies were, uh, why the structure of the country itself is the way it is today. Uh, you might notice some parallels there with the Presbyterians. Uh, very important. So, uh, Mr. Brooks, back to you. Yes. So when we survey the very early um, landscape in colonial America, so like 17th century, right, there's the ones that everyone knows. There's the the more cavalier types in the South who are much more of the old Church of England, and you have the Puritans in New England. And there are a few Presbyterians in New England, but it's mostly Congregationalists. Where the Presbyterians are coming to dominate is four, well, well, they're states now, but they would be colonies at the time, and that's New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland. New Jersey, more than any other one, is known as the Presbyterian stronghold, but they actually have quite a great deal of influence in all the rest of these uh, colonies, including really founding one of them and sort of fundamentally altering one of the other ones and the the presbyterians who are coming over in the early days they're by vast majority either scots irish or scottish there are plenty of english presbyterians but the the bulk of the presbyterians are coming from uh northern ireland or scotland and this this guy francis make me is considered kind of a father of American Presbyterianism. That's the title that he's given by the Presbyterian Historical Society um, of America. He's a Scots-Irish minister. 
and he decides to come over fairly early on, I want to say like mid to late 1600s, to help found an actual Presbyterian structure in America. Because there are plenty of Presbyterians, and there are quite a few Presbyterian churches. But to very briefly give an overview, the way Presbyterianism works in its church structure and church government, it's very small R Republican. So it's kind of building up structures. So they need or organization is something that they care a lot about and organizing in a way that's that's efficient and that, you know, you're not you don't have a bunch of stragglers and you don't have a bunch of like random people falling through the cracks, basically. So make me founds the Synod of Philadelphia in 1607 or 1706, sorry, 1706. Uh and this is the first real organized Presbyterian body in the United States. Right. And we have a, uh, we have a painting of Mr. Uh, or Reverend Make Me uh, on the screen right now uh, so that people have sort of a visual view. Um, and just to clarify one thing earlier for people that don't know um, uh, American religious denominations, um, the Congregationalists in New England are what most of you will know to be the Puritans, uh, which is a much broader brush to paint them with, but um, th that's who we're talking about uh, when you were talking about the religious character of the Northeast in particular. So, uh, but anyways, uh, carry on. Right, exactly. And this this kind of dates back to the English Civil War. You know, the the Presbyterians are Puritans as well. They just favor a different form of church government. So, touching on the touching on kind of the way that things are going in these four colonies you know new england is puritan but it is fundamentally congregationalist that's the way that the fathers of new england wanted their church government to look and with very very limited exception that was the way it was going to go because they were very effective in controlling what new england religious life was like and there wasn't really a lot of room for dissent as a lot of people discover the hard way. Right, and uh, something that might be good for clarifying right now, um, because I don't think we're... Well, we can throw in one more. Um, so, you know, we basically just said um, the Presbyterians are in that camp of Puritans. They just organize their churches different. So um, it might be worth uh, explaining very, very quickly, um, you know, how do Presbyterians organize? How do the Congregationalists organize? And then just for uh, throwing in contrast, how does, say, the Church of England organize? Uh, because then you get your three main sort of types. Yeah, that's your basic, like, your basic church government. Uh, the Congregational model is going to be, uh, as the name suggests, a congregation. So the congregation elects its ministers and trains them so far as it goes and this is basically the structure like maybe there's there's meetings you know in massachusetts there would be the general court that was called together and that would be you know most of the educated clergy but it's all of it originating from the congregation and the congregation is really almost its own independent body Right. And so hopefully you see this here, um, at least ideally, the sort of uh, appointing power is supposed to be within the congregation, the local church that you are a part of. Um, you select the you invite, select or train the pastor. Um, you have maybe a council for administration officers if you're big enough. And then you have all these different committees and whatnot else uh, in Massachusetts uh, or other New England uh, colonies and states uh, that you were mentioning. Um, there were state churches, so these things got pretty big and complex. So, uh, you know, this chart that you see here on the screen might be much more detailed. Um, or earlier on, when these uh, churches were just being founded and you only had a couple hundred people in a, in a local area, um, you know, this might even be simpler. You know, you might just have the pastor and maybe like a sort of like stewardship uh, council or something like that, uh, or a position. So, um but I, anyway, uh, the the power lies in the congregation here. Uh, so it's very right. decentralized, very local. Uh, very democratic. Yeah, very democratic, uh, but uh, but sort of like a like you might imagine a county elections or something like that. Um, so, right. 
you know, there's not major political controversies over what this congregation does until much, much later when these churches get huge. Um, and then by that point, they're starting to fall off. So um, it's sort of like a, it's a, probably a better democracy than what most people will immediately jump to thinking, but still a democracy. Uh, so, but well, that's your congregational yeah. model. The thing to remember too, with a lot of this stuff is like in, in early America and within these Presbyterian and, you know, congregational bodies, like when we say words like Republican or Democrat, it really doesn't mean like the modern mind is in a certain sense. It means something so different to us than it means to them in terms of what it conjures in the mind. That's kind of hard to wrap your mind around why someone would want a democratic church government. But, you know, the, there is a lot of that that's kind of the conceit of hindsight. So I try to, as much as I can, be fair to, to, the, to the congregational model and to, right. the, and to the Presbyterian model, historically. Right, and uh, if you look back, uh, these are very local. Um, you have a few families in here. They all know each other. Um, so this was usually a way to uh, prevent, um, one, subversion. Um, because this group of families, you're not going to get a majority of them, usually. Um, and then it's also a way to prevent corruption. So that was a big thing at this point in time. Um, if all these like-minded families are in this church, and they're the ones that uh, have the final say in, uh, uh, by Democratic vote, um, then you know, you're not going to get people that try to reinstitute, say, golden candles on the altar, uh, that try to reinstitute carved images in the church, all this other stuff that was uh, considered to be uh, reformed out. Um, you know, it's going to be uh, much more static, much more conservative on this local democracy. Uh, so the idea went at the time. Right, exactly. And if you recall from our uh, stream last year about the history of the Presbyterian or rather the Scottish church and the reformation there, you know, you had right. all these cases of like legit, illegitimate sons being appointed archbishop and all this stuff. And both with the Congregationalists and the Presbyterians, there is this long history of remembering this and being like, yeah, we want the opposite of that. No, no corruption, none of this like nepotism of these people who don't actually care. We want, we want our preaching to be strong. We want our ministers to really know their stuff and to care. And that's a lot of what goes into this particular uh, view of localism that both the congregational model and the Presbyterian model have baked into them. Right, and I'll pull up a graph of the Presbyterians and get on to them, uh, but just know that this is a sentiment shared by most uh, Calvinist denominations in America, so just jumping ahead slightly, if you look at a lot of these people, the number one thing that they will hate the government for is corruption and uh, you know wastefulness. Um, if you go around town to like the average American, they probably won't know what's happening in, say, the... Uh, the house or with executive orders or, you know, what's the biggest scandal online. Um, the, the thing that they will always jump to their red meat is uh, look at how corrupt these politicians are. Um, th this is a character that will go back centuries kind of to this uh, sort of origin point with this reformation, I would say. Yes. The Calvinist character is one that absolutely hates, hates corruption. It hates this sort of like, nepotistic well you know they're kind of a piece of crap but they're in charge and frankly i mean sometimes it'll get them into trouble a lot of the justification of some of the revolutions that even happen both in america and back in the old countries that are done by calvinists is like look at how incredibly despotic and corrupt this government is this government has absolutely no right to rule us a virtuous god ordained people we're not right. going to tolerate this crap. Right, exactly. And <laughs> you could be talking about there, the Reformation. You could be talking about the various revolutions, the civil wars. Uh, hopefully everyone sees this is in the character, and it's still very much visible today. And on the screen right now, I will just throw up the Presbyterian chart that I have. Um, so you can kind of see uh, it's a little bit different. Um, so... Before we get into this, uh, why don't you tell us what this sort of presbyt, presbyter, presbyterian means? Um, because this is a word that keeps popping up just to refresh yes. people. 
So presbyteros uh, is a Greek word that appears in the New Testament and the very loose translation that it comes like, well, it's not that loose, but the translation it comes to us as is elder. It's the biblical word that sort of means like overseer, or it could also be, you know, depending on congregation, it's rendered as bishop. There are Presbyterians who would not like, who would, if you rendered it as bishop, would not have a problem. This is just, this is the way they believe it looks and it does look. And essentially the way that this works is you have the general assembly, which is all these presbyteries. And a presbytery is made up of a session of elders of a particular region, specifically teaching elders, which is what we we would know as like pastors. Uh, that's the position that they would be called. They would be called a teaching elder. And that's the people who more or less are running your church. You have teaching elders and ruling elders. Ruling elders would come from the congregation and that's the that's some of the democratic structure, but the teaching elders are going to come from this broader body of the session of elders and the presbyteries that are training ministers. One of the things that the Presbyterians uh, have always cared deeply about is the education of their ministers, that their ministers would be theologically very competent. They would know what they're talking about. They would be careful teachers and readers of the word. And this is one of the things that actually gives them a lot of strength, but actually hindered their growth in America considerably is that Presbyterians refuse to compromise on this point as a general rule. They will not allow someone to teach in a church who has not been, in their view, properly educated. And you're not going to see the sort of thing that would happen in Baptist or Methodist churches where uh, a pastor might be trained sort of on the job or someone who it was just like, oh, well, they have a real talent for teaching. They would never be put right into that mode of teaching. It was always right. going to be after a long period of education. Right, and that doesn't lend themselves well to, say, frontier growth, uh, circuit riders, and all this other stuff where you don't have many people to go around. Uh, so um, <clears throat> so basically what happens, uh, America throughout basically its entire history up until the last century just keeps pushing westward. More people keep settling, um, and you will have a shortage of skilled people as you pr uh, push out that frontier. Uh, and it'll slowly catch up over time. Um, but what some churches did to accommodate this was they relaxed their standards. Uh, they would have one pastor or teacher uh, go between multiple churches on a uh, in a circuit is what it's called. Um, but usually this also just meant that you would relax a little bit more standards so that you could even do that. Um, the uh, the uh, churches that refused to com uh, compromise on their education standard uh, usually didn't follow this frontier growth, um, which is why you see Baptists and Methodists take over from the Congregationists, uh, Congregationalists, the uh, Presbyterians and the Church of England, uh, who usually did insist on this standard. Um, so just uh, you can kind of see that uh, conflict of aesthetics, if you will, there. Um, so the sort of American folk uh, folk aesthetic, you know, uh, out on the frontier, uh, very sort of localized. Uh, usually they will be Baptists or Methodists and usually not the more uh, what's considered the... Uh, more established, uh, sometimes high church looking um, Eastern denominations like the Church of England, the Presbyterians and whatnot else. That's exaggerating, uh, but you kind of see a sort of conflict in uh, cultural expression or aesthetic there, uh, which kind of ties in specifically to this point. They refuse to compromise on their uh, competency. Uh, so Right. And this is why, too, even even in the modern day and historically, Presbyterianism is mostly concentrated in the South and in the middle colonies, where they had plenty of, I mean, frankly, time, but also plenty of resources to properly equip their ministers to reach the churches that they wanted to reach, and where there were enough people that the churches you know, really like made sense and you had a ton of them. And I mean, there's something to be said too for like the South just having an inordinate amount of churches. Like it's it's <laughs> almost a culture shock yeah. going from the South to say the Mountain West where I've been much of my life. Because the Mountain West, you'll have like, you know, maybe one or two churches for a town and then it's like, well, it's another half hour, hour drive to the next town. This is the south you go into like the one town and it's like there are 12 churches 
and you can go to and the next ten of them town are over. Baptist. Yeah, <laughs> ten of them are bad. I mean, you just you're spoiled for choice, and there are a ton of them. It's just a sort of different, different organization and character in that sense. Right, and anyone that uh, that has followed me long enough will know that I joke about Oklahoma being very southern. Uh, this is one of my argument argumentative points. If you go to a small rural town in Oklahoma. Uh, you will find at least 10 Baptist churches and maybe 10 other churches that are, you know, one per denomination. So, um, and even as I, I, uh, I went to Alabama uh, and actually stayed there for uh, much longer than I would usually do uh, back in the summer. And I remember when I was driving through, just uh, through, you know, country towns, um, their tur- they have more churches there than we do up here, even though their towns had less people in them usually, uh, where I'm situated right now. So... Uh, the, when when uh when these people go on these streams or you hear it on the radio or in popular culture or whatnot and they say that the South has a lot of churches uh you know we mean it that 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 is a stereotype for a good reason, um so, uh with that uh is there anything else you wanted to cover on the uh, sort of Presbyterian model here uh, anything that would no be I think that I think that summarizes it rather well we can dive right back into sort of the the specific colonial experience of why things went the way that they did. Right. And just before we do, this one will be very quick um, because when, especially outsiders uh, imagine Christianity, um, I believe this is what they think of. Give me one moment here. Um, So this is the, um, the Episcopal Episcopal model. model. So um, this is entirely um, top down. Um, You have an archbishop, uh, who can be appointed or elected uh, in a variety of different ways, usually not by people in a congregation. Um, so this is sort of like a self-perpetuating model where the archbishop appoints bishops, and if it is an elected position, the bishops will vote on it. If it's not elected, um, you know, the archbishop is appointed by a higher power. Um, so, uh, And then those bishops will appoint uh, rectors, which will you know, usually preach, um, so <clears throat> basically this is the most sort of uh, top-down uh, administrative uh, organization for a church is the Church of England, the uh, Roman Church, um, the Orthodox in some sense, if I remember correctly, they have a slightly stranger model towards the top, but um, if I remember correctly, this is what they do. Um, there's a couple of Lutherans that will do this. Uh, can't think of many other people. I think that about covers it. The thing, the thing to note with this as well is that all three of these models in the colonial American experience, they're all Calvinist. Every single one of them. Yeah, right. And you can yeah. make the argument for which one is "quote unquote" more Calvinists, but all of them agree on what uh, what we in the modern day would call Calvinism. Right. Yeah, because you have. <laughs> The Congregationalists, the, the the Puritans, quote unquote, you know the the people that everyone reads about with their Plymouth Plantation that they're forced to read in like the uh, high school or whatever, uh, Calvinist Presbyterians, Calvinist Church of England, uh, gets a little iffy. Most people would consider them Calvinists. So, um, th- those well, are your models. At this time, they're Calvinists. Yeah. I mean, I think you can make an argument as to what the Church of England is as a general rule, and certainly once Methodism becomes a big thing, but in the right. colonial American experience, particularly before the revolution, the the Church of England in America is is deeply Calvinist. Right, and you have to, uh, there's sort of a more Roman uh, tendency is something that will come about much later uh, in the 1800s. We're not there yet. So um, <clears throat> those three models right there, um, you'll see a lot of Christian denominations that, that will say it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, you're not, a lot of denominations will say you're not breaking any sort of uh, biblical prohib- prohibitions if you just choose one. There are some that will absolutely insist on it. Um, that's a whole theological debate. It's not what we're here to talk about. So um, just so that you all know, um, when we're talking about Presbyterians, we're talking about that second graph we presented. It's much more classical Republican in structure, um, and it contrasts with the other two big denominations in America that is much one is much more local. The other one is much more uh, top down. Um, you might say classically authoritarian. Uh, so uh, you have people at the top that will make the final decision, and you get appointed someone, and that's how it is all the way down. We're in that middle classical R Republican uh, structure. So um, with that, 
I think we are ready to continue along our path uh, down the uh, colonial development here. Yes. So, in the case of all four of these colonies where Presbyterianism finds its strength, you know, New England is set as Congregationalist, and the Southern colonies, um, most of them, if not all of them, you could not hold public office of any kind without being a member of the Church of England. And there were specific oaths that they required as to that. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, just very, very little of influence anything other than, you know, a few sporadic, you know, Baptists or whatever, or nonconformists, and, you know, maybe a few missionaries in the later years. But it's these middle colonies where Presbyterianism finds its strength. William Penn, the, the guy who has the charter for the Pennsylvania colony, he brings over a huge amount of these uh, Scots-Irish and Scottish and, you know, a few English Presbyterians as well. And frankly, a lot of them come over actually as slaves or as free men. You know, the, there's a huge number of them that just die on the frontier. And that was basically their purpose, to be used as this buffer between the more violent uh you know, redskins on the savage, uh, you know, on the, on the frontier where they're not quite a huge problem, but you just don't want them coming into the coastal areas where trade is super important. And the right. Quakers obviously being pacifists. And it's like, well, we can't really count on them to defend themselves. So let's get, let's find whoever we can. Who's like the most violent Northern European Protestant possible and ship them in the largest quantities we can to the outer edge of our frontier. Right, and so you get that strategic bent there. Um, so William Penn that you mentioned, uh, most people will know him as the Quaker, and they make a, a huge deal over sort of religious tolerance and all this other stuff, or at least that's how the history books will say it. Um, mm -hmm. So what you just said is very obviously what happened. We need people for the frontier that will defend our cities, especially since we believe in uh, complete pacifism, um, which is what they would do all the time. So <laughs> in the history books, it'll kind of be, they imported all these different uh, religious uh, beliefs and universities and whatnot uh, because they believed in tolerance and diversity, which is absolutely hilarious. Um, yeah, there's this a, was very, a very calculated like... move. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting, like, the whole Quaker ethics, the way that they will twist themselves to sort of, like, to solve solutions that have a simple solution they're just not willing to do. Well, we can't fight, so let's just, you know, bring in essentially a bunch of slave labor to fight for us. It's like, all right, well, if it works, it works. But <laughs> Right, and that's the other thing as well. Um, if you want to get really technical, there's going to be a lot of indentured servitude. Um, there's going to be actual slavery that most people would recognize, um, and whatnot else. Um, it's just, we don't yeah. consider indentured servitude slavery because that breaks a lot of well, modern political narratives. But, um, the thing about that is like the, <clears throat> the phrase indentured, I'm sorry to like dwell on this. I won't take long. Yeah, no, no, it, go on. The phrase indentured servant is not, it has no historical basis. It's a word, right. a, a yeah. phrase that came about in the 20th century, I believe. And, James LaFond has a great a great bit on this, uh, on Myth of the 20th Century, where he talks about this in much greater detail than I have the time or energy for. But the basic point is, you know, it's not exactly the same as antebellum uh, slavery in the South, but it is a form of slavery. And right, yeah. huge numbers of these people, I, they had a much worse attrition rate than yes, yeah. what we would consider classical <clears throat> slavery because their terms were not it was not slavery for life but you know slavery for seven years on a frontier where there's like nothing you know i mean it's not for life but it kind of is well yeah <laughs> so with the uh, sort of cl uh, classical slavery if you want to call it that it's not really but that's what most people see it as um you're an investment to produce things with the indenture, which is uh, why, where you get the name from your contract. You basically write a contract, tear it into, um, you can put them together to prove that it's the same contract, right. the, the indenture. Um, indenture you're not, service. Yeah. Very rarely are you there to produce. You are there to civilize and tame the wilderness. 
which is much more deadly than um, go to this developed field and we will provide you your house for life, your food for life, because you know we're, we're investing in you and you're just going to be our farmer. With the indenture, uh, the indentured servant, uh, to use the anachronism, um, you basically tell these people, if you survive these seven or so years, 14 years, whatever the uh, term is that you sign up on, um, at the end, we'll give you land, a gun, and clothing, uh, maybe like a marriage or something with our uh, established family. Um, but the catch well, there see, is... This is the other thing. Sorry to interject here, but the yeah, other yeah. thing that really makes me angry about the Quakers... See, the Quakers would not give them weapons. You know, because violence is against right. the idea of, of a Quaker. They just send them out to the front. Like, yeah, okay, just survive. No, but you can't have any weapons. Because, you know, because <laughs> that, be, that would be evil. Right, so... Um... If you didn't get contracted by a Quaker, some you would usually get a gun, land, and uh, you would keep like a house or something right. that you built out there. Um, but the Quakers here, um, these are, uh, there was a big push a couple of years ago to say they were the original social engineers in America, and that wasn't entirely incorrect. Um, some of them could have been very malicious with it. Some of them probably weren't. Um, if I were to give my bet, and you would know a lot more about this than I would, um, it's probably the same sort of thing with um, Americans today that will focus on the foreign missions above their own because they think it's more moral, even though it has a much worse impact on their own uh, home. Yeah, I, I see a lot of analogs there. I mean, you are you are asking me, and the Quakers are probably like the highest the highest people on my crap list in terms of denominations I cannot stand. But, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be said that probably a lot of them did. They did genuinely believe this stuff and they thought they were doing the right thing. But, yeah, their, their record in colonial America is one that leaves me with a decidedly bitter taste in my mouth. Right. So um, hopefully everyone has a picture there. And I think we're ready to go on. We have our uh, exceedingly uh, stern uh, and willing to do violence uh, frontiersmen now in Pennsylvania. Yes. So Delaware is a break off from Pennsylvania, and it's mostly Presbyterian or other Calvinist families who just decide that they're not going to tolerate being under the pens and being under Quaker rule. So it's it's a pretty small state, obviously, compared to Pennsylvania. But, you know, they successfully break off. They are then their own thing. Uh, there's not a whole lot to comment about them. New Jersey is just one of these states that is just dominated by Presbyterian immigration. And the people there who aren't Presbyterians are actually a lot of them Dutch Calvinists, which is very, very similar. Like uh, Dutch Calvinism is kind of, it's a blend. You know, some of them favor more Episcopal uh, church government, some of them favor more Presbyterian, but they're very friendly to both. So, and New right. Jersey and is where it might be college... worth saying, um, just yeah. before we move on. The only reason that they're like different is because they developed in a different area. Um, because a lot of the times we'll get people that are new to this, um, and they'll so sort of see the meme why so many Protestant denominations, uh, without actually seeing. The reason that there are so many is because they developed in different areas and you didn't have communication, but they mostly believe right. like 99% the same things half the time. Um, yeah. So these Dutch Calvinists are different. There's not like some giant uh, split where they split away from the uh, American Presbyterians because they like the Dutch version better. It's because they developed in the Netherlands, in the Low Countries, and you can't really communicate with all the other Calvinists at the time because it's the, uh, it's the 16th century. So... Um, that, that's just why there's so many different things for the, uh, for the new onlooker. Right, exactly. Like the, there's almost no doctrinal disagreement between a Dutch Calvinist and, say, an English Presbyterian. Right, yeah. So that's kind of... New Jersey is worth commenting on as well because New Jersey... New Jersey is one of the only states where uh, Presbyterianism is still the largest denomination and say like a particular county or something uh, it's just because they totally dominate this area and princeton is is also new jersey and princeton is like the presbyterian school we'll touch on this a little bit more but even before the revolution 
Princeton is like the Presbyterian elite school and has been that way basically its entire existence. Right. And if not just like the elite school of the country, like they, <laughs> I don't think you need to relegate that just to Presbyterians. Like most people would consider Princeton, uh, what would it be like top, top 10 in terms of just prestige? Maybe yeah, top five. For sure. Um, especially its history, its history department has probably shaped American historiography more than any other, uh, university, except maybe some of the other Ivy league. Um, but you know, it, we'll get into why that is, but yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's those cases. And I think those are all fairly straightforward, but Maryland, Maryland is very interesting because Maryland is founded as a Catholic colony, the Calvert family who are, I believe, recusing Catholics, basically founded this little slice of America that would be Catholic for them and sort of a, a Catholic colony and their, their wish for what it would be. And this takes place shortly, I want to say, this might be either during the English Civil War or shortly before or after it right and um it's it's worth saying um we covered this uh panama hat and i covered this ever so slightly the sort of sentiment i'm about to describe on our gunpowder plot stream and uh we did as well on our uh, scottish reformation stream um in england uh and parts of scotland there was a huge distrust uh for catholics and especially French sympathizing Catholics at the time. Um, if you know a little bit of English history and all, whatnot else, not what we're here to discuss, you, you know, that, that would make sense. Um, and you have a Catholic or a charter for this little area in the uh, New World around what's called the Potomac, um, just handed out to a very Roman Catholic family. Um, and, and a very prosperous one, uh, credit where credit's due. They do end up producing quite a lot of influential things for their own denomination. Um, and they named the colony after, I believe it was the French, uh, queen at the time, uh, the, uh, the French bride to the, uh, to the monarch. Uh, it didn't really help the image too terribly much, but it was also a place that they could just, uh, throw people at if they didn't like them over in the home country. Um, so... Right. You have to keep in mind, not just for England, but for all these European countries, like the 17th century, the new world is kind of like the moon, except for it's it's easier to throw like dissidents that you just don't want to deal with anymore. You're like, nah, just ship them to America. They'll be fine. You know, either they'll be killed or, you know, like if they are, if they do survive, they're not going to do that much harm because they're just over there. Right, and, and then you had some optimists that were like, even if they do survive, they might actually do something over there and not here. You know? Yeah, exactly. So you have, you have a lot of that. But what has happened to Maryland is that you've had a huge amount of immigration from, you know, from these classic Scots-Irish uh, Presbyterians and English Presbyterians and English Puritans and even some quite a bit of moving from New England, you know, New England wound up in a situation where they actually, they had more people than they had space, which they had quite a bit of space, but you know, when you got those classic New England Puritan families where you got 12 kids to each son, you know, do that one or two or three generations and you have actually a pretty staggering amount of people. So you got a lot of moving. Yeah, especially at that time as well. Right. So Maryland winds up in a situation where it's ruled, the way that they would call it, it ruled autocratically by literal Catholics. And all these sort of like low Calvinists are thinking to themselves, you know, like what what went wrong here? This is... uh, this is our country. They're not supposed to be here. You know, you have all this distrust that has built up over the previous several centuries. And then on top of that, just the idea of aristocracy in America, unless you're in very specific areas to these much like lower church Calvinists, it just kind of rubs them the wrong way. I, I think there's a lot to be said for a lot of the a lot of the conflict 
that happened here is a situation where it was a rare case of the aristocracy not being everything that like a low church Calvinist will accuse them of. Cause you know, the Calvert family was not that bad, but right, yeah. they were Catholic. And like that, the charge that was made of the English aristocracy, which was generally not true. It was generally true that they were, they were just high church, but the like the middle class Calvinist critique is no, they're all papists and we can't trust them because they're all papists. <laughs> Corrupt papists at that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, they're the sort of like despotic. They're going to hand all the titles to like their buddy. They're not going to, they're not really, they don't really care about doing what's right. They don't really care about settling, you know, whatever it, whatever it is, that's the issue of the day. So there's a lot of pent up feeling of like these people ruling is a threat to our existence. Right. And you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't a situation either where the Calvert family was totally you know it's it's funny you can kind of see it from both ways because the Calvert family starts restricting suffrage it starts restricting the ability of any of these people to have any political power whatsoever and i mean from their perspective you can kind of understand it because obviously like these people more or less kind of don't think you have the right to rule any of this Right. Uh, but from the the low Protestant perspective, the Calvinist perspective, it's he's literally taking what little we have. We must fight. So you right. have this situation that develops kind of alongside the glorious revolution back in England. That's called the Protestant Revolution in Maryland. And essentially, your your middle class types who are sort of in the assembly but who don't really have a connection to the Calvert family. And this is one of the other complaints is like, if you wanted power in Maryland, you basically had to like either marry into the Calvert family or else have some other like specific connection to it. Right. And it and, really rubbed these people the wrong way. Right. And uh, I, I believe uh, just due to like a story that I uh, had in a book at one point in time, I talked to this on one of AA streams. It must have been like a year and a half ago at this point. I believe I described it as a uh, Calvinist pirates taking down a uh, Catholic monarchy, <laughs> um, which uh, a little bit oversimplified, but that's kind of what happened here for sort of like your uh, colonial adventure story. Um, yeah, if you wanted to simplify it, like that is very much what happened that's another thing that's sort of uh that's sort of interesting that's for maybe another day is calvinism and piracy because there's actually quite a bit of connection <laughs> there but that's yeah. another story um and so this uh this story um i'm interested in but for two different reasons and um, they go different directions um on the one hand i feel like a lot of these issues could have been resolved if uh if most of these colonies just had like a designated religious or religious group or family or something like that. And the people that were of this religion just went there and the other ones went to the other place and you just sort of, uh, kept the peace by separation. Um, but then on the other hand, that doesn't really, you know, help the people that were in this area, just given to uh, Roman Catholics suddenly for, you know, a couple generations now at that point, you know, out in the frontier, you know, it doesn't really help them, the people that have actually domesticated the land. Um, so, there's a conflict there, and that's for anyone looking onward that's wondering why isn't there just a uh, the happy solution here. That that's why uh, it's because it's not really a uh, you, you have a lot of a uh, vying interests here uh, because you also have the homeland to consider because they don't want to uh, keep dealing with perpetual Catholic revolts every time there's a succession of the monarch. Um, so why not just send them to the new world? Well, where in the new world are you going to pick? You can't pick like the the desolate center, because that's just literally saying, go die in the middle of this uh, random place that we just found. And, you know, a lot of these people were usually friendly with the uh, lawmakers, the monarch, the executive. Um, so, you know, the, there's no reason to just anger them. Uh, so, you know, th this is the uh, this is the complicated uh, situation that you have to deal with here. Yeah, there's a lot of political tension where you're kind of like, you can really see it from all angles. Like, it's just a kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't situation where, you know, there was just going to be conflict. And unfortunately, that's just kind of how it is. The other thing that kind of ties in here is in the other colonies, there's sort of a feeling of like, 
of worry about any sort of Catholic stronghold developing or even being allowed to develop. You know, later during the revolutionary era, one of the things that is put under the intolerable acts that the King of England does to the American colonies is the toleration of French Catholics in Quebec. The American colonists view this with extreme suspicion and distaste. And it's this this idea that, you know, maybe isn't consciously stated, but I think you can kind of see even here in the 17th century of like any Catholic stronghold in North America is a threat to us. And we don't want to permit its existence if we don't have to. Right. And that sounds extreme today, but you have to keep in mind uh, all of Europe is just coming off the end of the uh, of the religious wars. Um, you had the religious wars in France. You had the uh, uh, the great Thirty Years' War. Um, you had the English Civil War. Uh, everyone is very distrustful of each other because it's the worst thing that anyone had seen for centuries. Um, the most destructive war up until that point. You had uh, most German river towns were left completely desolated. Um, you had many a village burned and sacked in the English Civil War. Um, you had many massacres in the French Wars of Religion. Uh, you had the Inquisition going around the uh, the other Roman Catholic strongholds. Uh, uh, and it doesn't matter what was necessarily actually happening. The word that got out was that they were quite gruesome. And one side saw that as perfectly fine, and the other side saw that as absolutely detestable. It wasn't, uh, no, this isn't happening. It was, uh, yes, this is happening, and it's good uh, defense from the, uh, from the Romans at the time, at the least. So... Um, <laughs> Religious peace is not going to be found here, um, and I think that's a. I think we probably covered Maryland well enough to actually talk about you know what happened after the uh, after these Calvinists took over. Yeah, so the Calvinists basically take over Maryland, and so now these four colonies stand as the as the strongholds of Presbyterianism specifically, from which it can grow and sort of spread its influence everywhere. Because what winds up happening is, you know, Presbyterianism starts to bleed into these other colonies. It starts to bleed into uh, New York and even, you know, New England in a way that it hadn't before. And it does into Mar or Virginia, rather. Uh, Patrick Henry was educated and his mother would take him to hear the preaching of a Presbyterian minister, which for the time was kind of unheard of because in Virginia, you could not hold office without being a member of the Church of England. And these Presbyterians refused to do that. But, you know, there are multiple scholars of Patrick Henry who will say a lot of his, the development of his early oratory comes from these very fiery Presbyterian sermons that he hears as a child. Right, and... Uh... For people that don't know, this isn't exclusive, um, but most of the sort of fire and brimstone preaching that you hear in America at the time is usually from Presbyterian with a few Congregationalists uh, sprung into the mix. Um, obvious, obviously, you have a few famous uh, Congregationalists that are m probably more famous to this day, um, but if you want your real fire and brimstone um rhetoric and aesthetic and, uh, you know, actual theological message. Um, these Presbyterians are the ones that you want to look for. And especially when we get into the Civil War era, um, you'll sort of see that influence. Uh, this isn't like a, this isn't like a sort of like cute detail to just mention because it's going to actually shape uh, national politics quite extensively later. Right, exactly. And the brief thing to mention here as well is that in the mid 1700s presbyterianism fights with itself over what at the time was uh debated as the old side and new side controversy and this is essentially whether its ministers need to be formally educated at princeton which was like you know the school i mean it could have been any other school but the vast majority of them went to princeton but there was debate over this because you know the more frontier areas were uh they, they wanted pastors and they weren't too concerned whether they they really had to be educated as long as they were good at their job. But the Presbyterian character was something that was pushing very hard for, no, 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 we must have our ministers properly educated. So we 
you know, we, we have some control over what they're saying. There's a famous case uh, of Charles Finney, who's a very famous American evangelist. He starts out as a Presbyterian and he's eventually like, he finds Calvinism to be something that he can't support. And he's called back and they're like, you swore to uphold the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is a Calvinist document. And he goes, yeah, but I didn't like, I didn't actually read it. I just swore to it. And it's just like one of these moments of you know, Presbyterianism feeling itself growing a little bit too low church and pushing hard in the other direction. And so there's actually sort of a later splinter that will come out of this. And the church is sort of for now reunite. But there's later going to be a thing called the Cumberland Presbyterian Church, which is very, very small. And it's basically the only Presbyterians who don't believe in the formal education of their ministers. And they essentially got kicked out of the Presbyterian Church in America because of this. Because there was this fear of like, look, if you just let evangelists and such run away with you, they're going to be, we have no idea what doctrine they're going to be tre teaching, and we can't trust them as such. Right, and just so that uh, we didn't talk much about what actually, uh, you know, Presbyterianism entails, um, but if anyone uh, even remembers some of the evangelical stuff that I did with AA, especially the first stream where we went into sort of the uh, early part of this, evangelicalism um one of the things that they would end up pushing and this sort of starts around here but will it'll take off when we hit about 1800 or so um and it already had happened in uh, europe at this point in time with its pietist movement um was the idea that you don't baptize babies um because they don't know what's actually happening happening they don't have reason and all this other uh stuff that you'd use to justify it um presbyterians uh will baptize babies and that's a, you know, it's a minor detail, um, but it kind of goes to see, uh, goes to show where their uh, differences in doctrine are. Because a lot of these American uh, pietists um, were usually a bit um, uncomfortable with that. Um, and that's why a lot of them would end up uh, doing adult baptisms only. And to this day is still kind of what happens. Um, most of uh, the majority of Americans at this point in time would probably view a baptism as something that you do as a uh, as an adult who can think and speak. Um, but if you go back to what we're talking about, sort of the mid 1700s, um, you know, the, a baptism was something that happened with children. It's where the family shows up. The uh, child is baptized in front of the uh, from the congregation, usually by sprinkling or whatnot else. Um and that's the uh, th this is this is one of the areas where they start to to uh, fracture, and it's not just the Presbyterians, but other ones as well. Yeah. Um, and if you're in Europe, this has already happened. Right. This is this is coming over to America a little bit later, but the Pietist movement really does does kind of a number on American Christianity, and I think I think there's a lot to be said that Pietism is almost like a fault line that runs through American Christianity, whether you view it as a positive or negative innovation it splits not just the not just the presbyterians but really all of these denominations and if you look at what happens to new england in a lot of ways pietism is one of these things that really kind of cuts off the if you want to call it that the puritan theocracy off at the knees yeah um and that's for two reasons um so if you haven't noticed yet there's a lot of demographic problems here um with the Calvin or with the Calvinists taking over Maryland, it was demographics. Um, with the uh, Pennsylvanians originally being under a Welsh, uh, a Welsh uh, Quaker colony, um, that will later give way to literally everything else. And then now, in New England, with their Congregationalist, very extremely conservative Congregationalist uh, systems of government, you would have a large inflow of uh, basically Pietists from the old world. While at the same time, these people would be converting the old, uh, what were called the old lights or the uh, the old school, uh, depending on which congregation or uh, denomination you're in, um, they would be converting them until the point where the uh, the old conservative uh, system didn't have the people to keep it afloat any longer, and it would basically just sort of uh, 
peter out and uh, just uh, stumble along until it would eventually just uh, subsume into something else. So, um, would you like to, uh, do we want to touch more on exactly what the uh, sort of new sides were saying? Um, because that, that's a little bit, but uh, I, I figure there's probably a little bit more uh, doctrinal difference there. Well, I mean, there is and there isn't. The trouble with pietism as such is that it's very, very difficult to get at. I mean, I, I you being a Lutheran, I assume you have quite a bit of experience with this, but even like if you will talk to if you will talk to Baptists or even maybe Baptist adjacent people, you will run into a lot of this like spiritual but not religious, you know, no creeds but Christ. It's like they're not they're not saying things that are heretical exactly. It's just that they're being very, very doctrinally fuzzy, and that makes them very, very difficult to like, well, what actually do you believe? And more to the point, if you're going to be educating a congregation, if you're going to be leading them in the word of God, what are you going to be teaching them? And you're kind of like, you almost don't have an answer. And the evangelical impulse, you know, the, the counterweight there of saying like, well, we're getting them on, you know, the things that are truly important. You know, it's it's very, very complicated. A lot of the reason why both New England and the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians even struggle with this is like, you know, when you argue with a pietist about religion, it's just very, very difficult. And it winds up almost like it can very easily turn into almost a an interrogation of your own faith. Well, are you really a Christian? You know, I know you believe all this doctrine stuff, but do you feel it the way I feel it? It's a it's almost a different way of like understanding and experiencing religion. And so it's very, very difficult. It, it's almost, it's not, but in a certain sense, it's way like an introduce. It was like introducing a new form of Christianity on some level into all of these denominations. Right. And that's, uh, that's why you'll see uh, <laughs> in the modern day, it's, it has different connotations. Uh, but if you take this view that we're uh, crafting here, um, you can see that there is an evangelical part of Christianity in the U.S. at this point in time, and there's a very non-evangelical part of Christianity as well. Um, you know, th these things will grow and develop along different paths. They will diverge. Um, but um, I think the key thing to understand here is um, most of these denominations, including the Presbyterians, will fight with themselves, split, um, will have a... Uh, I don't want to say development because that implies something theologically, but they will uh, clarify or uh, uh, argue or debate over specific things at this point in time um, because of this uh, pietist um, or uh, new light or new side uh, influence here. Yeah, exactly. Now, I will say, you know, the pietist Presbyterians, both old side and new side, they are both extremely Republican in terms of their yeah. smaller Republican in terms of their political sensibilities. So even though this is kind of tearing them apart, they're still fundamentally united, very united in terms of their politics. Right. And this will be important, especially for the revolution and also for the civil war, because these, uh, these small differences that we're talking about now will grow. Um, so I think if you're ready, uh, we can go into the uh, revolution. Um, yes. We talked about the intolerable, the intolerable mm -hmm. acts. And, you know, I think about 40% of my audience is American. Uh, once the videos hit about a thousand views or so, um, just to give a very, very brief overview, I know you and I have heard it to the back of our teeth, what caused the American Revolution, and we have the same list of events we could rattle off. Um, but uh, why don't you give like a very brief overview, what was happening in the colonies, uh, why was there this split developing, what were the intolerable acts, what was the response, yeah, very quickly. Okay, so you have a couple things to hit on. First of all, the American colonies have developed... For the last you know hundred or more years you know there, there's been a lot of influence from england obviously but there has been a lot of independence in the way that they conduct their business you know the old glory club did a good stream on this where they talked about how new england started minting their own currency in the 17th century which was extremely illegal 
but they kind of got away with it by you know whenever the king would be like hey what are you doing they would just send him a bunch of tribute and not send any representative they didn't even attempt to explain their actions they just tried to kind of appease him and it actually kind of worked um and the other colonies you know it's not quite to the same degree but there is a, a very strong sort of spirit of independence and during the revolutionary era so like the lead up to it so like 1760s the french and indian war had just ended and this was a war of global proportions but it's a war that had really started in north america actually with a very young george washington who is a member of the uh, virginia militia and there was sort of a disconnect that happened because of this war you know back in england there was this feeling of like we bailed the provincials out the least they could do is shoulder all of the debts that we want them to pay from this war that we feel they should pay for primarily. And from the American perspective, it was kind of like, this war has been going on for all this time. You barely sent any help. We kind of had to do it ourselves. So like, we're grateful and all, but like, you, first of all, you didn't finish the job because Quebec is still around and still Catholic. And second of all, uh, we're the ones who did all the work here. Like, what are you trying to tax us for? And they're, they're, on top of this, too, you had sort of something that's a through line through all of American colonial history, which is sort of a disagreement between the colonists and the old country about what exactly these royal charters, what exactly they meant and just how much autonomy that they gave. And the general perspective was they gave as much autonomy as you could reasonably claim. They would take every, you know, it's the, if you give a mouse a cookie thing, right? Like that's even the funny thing where so many of these royal charters, like of Virginia or these other countries, they'll just stretch the line all the way to the Pacific of like their border. Yeah. Yeah. They'll just be like, yeah, just draw it straight. It's just all the way there. You know, North Carolina, <laughs> North Carolina goes all the way to California. Virginia goes all the way to California. You know, it's just like, but if, from their perspective, it made sense. Yeah, if you uh, if you look back at old maps of the United States, uh, for the audience that hasn't done it, um, it looks sort of like the Middle East, except we just kind of took rulers and drew parallel horizontal lines for each of the states going across the uh, country. It's kind of it's kind of funny. It is. It looks really funny on a map. I will say. The other thing that you have is you know, the English Civil War is at this point about a hundred years, uh, a little bit over a hundred years removed, and it was this fight over like how much power does sort of the old aristocracy, the king, have versus popular government, which at this point meant a much more republican form of government. Like democracy, as such, would be pretty alien to all of these people but republican government smaller republican government would not and uh people have commented that uh, th there's one particular quote i have here from lorraine botner who says calvinism is the chief source of republican government and if you take as gospel you know that almost all of these guys who are in the colonies no matter what denomination they're in they're all calvinists and on top of that you had a ton of immigration from all these, if not veterans of the uh, English Civil War, kind of veterans of the ideas of the English Civil War in a certain sense. Like you have New England, which is essentially what Cromwell wanted to happen in England, and it actually did happen in New England. And on top of that, you got the Cavaliers who came to Virginia and came in many cases because of Cromwell's victory. And then you have all these other, you know, Scots-Irish Calvinists and Scottish Calvinists and such. And all of this makes for almost a, a witch's brew of really like, of course we self-rule. That's, uh, that's our right. That's, that's natural. There's no aristocracy here. There's no king. I mean, there was the, there was King George in the, in the general sense, but King George was one of these figures who's kind of like far off and he's not really interfering very much in the direct affairs of the colonies and therefore it's kind of like a yeah we like that guy because you know he's not he, he doesn't affect us so much but back in england you got the view of like well these are provincial subjects of course we can tax them to our heart's content we're parliament and 
and you also had the, uh, this is getting a little bit into the weeds here, um, mm -hmm. but uh, these were the actual arguments, like this isn't really an oversimplification, and they would double down on this, the idea of virtual representation, uh, which is uh, sort of like a syllogism of um, Englishmen are represented by Parliament. The colonies are full of Englishmen. Therefore, the colonies are represented by the English Parliament, whether or not they have a seat. You know, so. right? Exactly. <laughs> it's a, it's it's a hilarious. Only the English could come up with such a, a such a political argument. But um, well, it worked very well, right? But okay, but it's interesting <laughs> too, right? Like Edmund Burke, the chief parliamentary, I guess you could say, champion of American independence, is himself a Presbyterian and a very strong one. Right. Um, and, and once again, if you haven't caught uh, what Mr. Brooks uh, presented to Panama Hat and I and uh, Mr. Nathan Hood, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the Presbyterian character over on the British Isles, though we didn't quite get to Edmund Burke. Um, but that's sort of like the uh, lead up to it. Um, so this whole uh, this whole time, you have this idea. Um, ooh, actually, we can demonstrate this point even better. Uh, most people have heard of the concept of popular sovereignty. Um, and I, I don't know if it's explicitly, but I would say that you cannot have that without the Calvinism, um, you know, sort of like, no, a, you can't. So, uh, popular sovereignty, whether it's in the American civil war, the American colonies, uh, Woodrow Wilson, anything like that, that is going to be a Calvinist idea. So, uh, obviously that's going to play a part here in the American revolution where the argument's going to be, we have organized ourselves, um, for, you know, centuries at this point, um, all of our people have never even seen King George. The only place that these people would come across even his image was a statue or maybe a painting if they were in the city. Um, you also have the uh, you also have the uh, the difference of they're the ones out there actually doing the work. Uh, if it's a colonial war, it's the colonial population that fights it. If it's uh, claiming the frontier for England, it's the colonial population that's doing it. Um, all of this is obviously going to give rise to an idea that looks very, very similar to popular sovereignty. Yes, and there's another point to add on this as well that factors very prominently into like the way that the Scots-Irish would view this particular issue, and that is that the frontier was was being that the King of England wanted the frontier to stop. He wanted it to. Uh, to halt at a particular line. No, 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 don't go beyond this line. And of course, to America, who are all drawing their, their borders all the way out to California, they're like, oh, what? Right, and so if anyone's taken an American history class, they'll know that this line was basically at the Appalachians, um, which is really an issue at this point in time, because most settlements had moved beyond the Appalachians. They were sort of a... Uh, they weren't developed, obviously, but sort of the uh, the fringes were moving way beyond that into Indian territory. Um, why specifically Indian territory is that the issue? Um, because the uh, the English government wanted to make alliances with a lot of the Indian tribes for border security for like a uh, sort of as like a uh, strategic uh, threat against any of the other European colonies in the New World. Um, but you know, it, whatever the reason is. This is not a good idea. Once you had, in the previous hundred years, shipped over the most stern and the most hostile frontiersmen that you could and promised them as much land as they could get. Um, well, and even, like, Virginia, right, has the Ohio Company at this point. Like, they're literally speculating on most of the state of Ohio. And Great Britain's like, no, actually, you can't have any of that. That's supposed to be for, uh, for the Indians. Right, and... This actually ties back into a previous point. Uh, let me go. Uh, let me just show you this. This is a uh, ever so slightly incorrect, but it basically demonstrates the idea. It's not a uh, chronological map. You'll see what I mean. Um, these were the lands that were claimed by the colonies. <laughs> so here you, you can see our uh, horizontal line thing that we were joking about, but that that's basically what the charters were. Um, you see the uh, grand uh, combined Virginia that we no longer have to this day. Um, you can see sort of leftovers where they just sort of chartered over each other. So Connecticut, you can see, had this line going all the way across here. And then suddenly you had uh, William Penn's Pennsylvania uh, thrown into the mix. Uh, Massachusetts would later give up Maine, I believe, in like the 1800s. 
um, during one of the compromises. So um, this is what you're looking at. And the British government basically told them, uh, you're basically not allowed to go past the line that looks somewhat like this. Um, if you uh, sort of look at what's being drawn here, um, you're basically being limited to the most developed, the most settled parts of the colonies. Um, good luck if you can find anything. By the way, our promises of land are now null and void. So Right, exactly. And it's also, yes, you need to stay in the area that's already been picked over and where you know land is not... I mean, where you just you already have so many people that it's just like, okay, well, good luck finding a good farm, especially right. if you're like poor and dispossessed. Yeah, lol, good luck. And that's you have a lot of schizophrenia here. You have to keep in mind, um, governments cannot act at this point as a singular entity, just because the communication infrastructure is not there. Um, so this southern colony here, Georgia, was specifically founded for the English poor and dispossessed to go and settle. Um, literally, the idea was we will take the poorest of England, we will even ship them over there free of cost, and they can just go and settle Georgia. Um, you know, basically, we'll let, we'll let the poor give a, have an opportunity to not be so poor. They can actually hold land and provide for themselves, and they won't be over here in the home country to cause us problems. Um, basically, I believe it would be uh, 15 years, give or take, after this colony was actually legally founded. Uh, is that correct? I believe it was the 1750s. Yeah, um, that sounds right. Basically, like a decade after, um, the English government comes out and says, oh, by the way, you can't really settle most of that anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah, literally. Well, so, okay, in the 1750s, the other bit here is that, you know, having read the writings of Benjamin Franklin and a few other people, but Franklin particularly, you kind of get the idea, you know, decades before the revolution, mm -hmm. that there are angling for independence already like the thing about franklin that's very very interesting is you kind of get that idea from his writings that like really back in even the 1750s he was kind of like kind of had the wheels spinning about how how can we get our own country and there's this quote i want to share from uh, dr wh roberts about the presbyterian church in america and it starts Quote, from 1706 to the opening of the revolutionary struggle, the only body in existence which stood for our present national political organization, republicanism, was the General Synod of the American Presbyterian Church. The congregational churches of New England had no connection with each other and, no, and had no power apart from the civil government. The Episcopal Church was without organization in the colonies and was dependent on, for support and a ministry on the established Church of England and was filled with an immense loyalty for the British monarchy. The reformed Dutch church did not become efficient and uh, become an efficient and an independent organization until 1771, and the German reformed church did not attain the condition until 1793. The Baptist churches were separate organizations, the Methodists were practically unknown, and the Quakers were non-combatants. Right, and literally any other church you can think of as well had like four people in it, so... <laughs> so that's the uh that's the landscape you're looking at here um and this is a i don't know if we mentioned it in our stream talking about the scottish reformation um but that uh event over in scotland and its uh influence on the colonies is kind of what leads to this separate national character um where you have on one side the american colonies which are very much influenced by this uh looking back to classical forms of government, especially republicanism, which hadn't really been used in Europe for a long time. Like the republics that you had in Europe were all basically merchant oligarchies. They weren't the, uh, they weren't really a sort of classical republic. Yeah. The idea of a human republic was totally alien. There were republics, right. but it was always a, like the, the, the distinction between a merchant republic and a human republic is, is one that I think uh, is well illustrated here. Right. So this uh, this one denomination that exists because of a reformation that happened in Scotland a couple hundred years beforehand um, is what's going to inspire a lot of these people to either already have an affinity for this classical form of Republican governance or to look back to it at all. Um, so you get a lot of uh, yeah, people, uh... especially... Uh, Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you get a lot of people that will talk about Anglicanism 
inspiring a sort of a looking back to the old church fathers and translating them. Um, the Presbyterians do a lot of work on uh, not well, obviously they do work on the early church, but they also do quite a lot of research into uh, ancient history and especially ancient political theory, um, which is part of how we get this uh, structure of government applied to civil government, not just church government. Yes, exactly. There's another quote here from uh, George Bancroft. Uh, quote, the revolution of 1776, so far as it was affected by religion, was a Presbyterian measure. It was the natural outgrowth of the principles which the Presbyterianism of the old world planted in her sons, the English Puritans, the Scotch Covenanters, the French Huguenots, the Dutch Calvinists, and the Presbyterians of Ulster. Right, and so this is a this is interesting to me because I will have a question later when we get to it. Um, because when you mention Presbyterians and Ulster, um, usually the thing that doesn't come to mind is a uh, rabid uh, breaking away from Great Britain. Uh, so we'll we'll get to that soon. Um, but I I think we've made the uh, case now for the sort of Presbyterian nature of America at least implicitly, um, because obviously you're not going to get any of them. Uh, to explicitly put in any sort of extremely major document saying we are Presbyterian. Um, but you will find them saying something like, uh, something that sounds very Presbyterian in an organization. Uh, basically, every founding father, uh, going from the least well-known ones to the uh, most popular, will have this sort of affinity for classical Republican governance, um, which they probably were really only exposed to because of the works of these Presbyterians. Yeah, they were. Well, it's even interesting, right? Like I mentioned Princeton, nearly a third of the founding fathers graduated from Princeton. And Princeton was an explicitly Presbyterian institution. So anyone who had gone through that body would have received at least a nominally Presbyterian education. They would be very familiar with Presbyterian ideas and church government and such. Well, yeah, and I think that just seals the case there. Um, so just... Let's, uh, let's cover just a couple of things here um, for people that don't know. Um, in very brief overview here is be uh, overviews here because it's not the main focus here. Um, in the American Revolution, uh, how exactly did the sides fall? Because we've obviously got one sort of pro-American side, not necessarily independence just yet. Uh, I believe that would take a while to become the dominant faction. Um, but you have one pro-colony or pro-American side, and you have one pro-English side. Um, what were the kinds of people on each side? So on the pro-American side are going to be, generally speaking, your uh, your human types. Your, you had a lot of merchants on that side as well. I mean, I know that's kind of like, that's a meme to say. And then you had a lot of actually planters as well. Like you had Washington and people like him were actually big supporters of the revolution. And there's, you know, there's a lot of kind of complicated, somewhat esoteric reasons why, why they had beyond just their general feeling, but it really was the middle colonies, uh, were overwhelmingly in favor. The, the, the human types, so the people who were not quite wealthy, but they weren't exactly poor either, of the middle colonies were very much revolutionaries. Uh, New England was probably the most revolutionary to start off with. And I mean, obviously, looking back on their history, they've already defied Britain many, many times. And then the sort of planter class in Virginia is the final piece that really pushes pushes this all together. You know, it's very, you know, it sounds kind of trite now, but it's very, very famous that all of the all of the colonies voted together for independence. There was not a single dissension in that vote. All right. And then who would have been sort of on the English side or the royalist or loyalist side? So the royalist side would have been much more your either officials who were appointed by the crown or families who had a lot of those connections. And then in some cases, actually, the there were aspects of the frontier that were very loyal to the to the crown. Um, you know, there there are some interesting cases as well of also somewhat middle class people being very loyal, and the South generally is a little bit more loyal than 
uh, certainly the New England and maybe generally than the middle colonies towards towards England. Right. I seem to recall there were a couple Southern campaigns uh, in the Revolutionary War due to uh, loyalist holdouts. Well, and that whole thing is very interesting, too, because it winds up really being a civil war more than it is a more than it is even a war between Great Britain and America. You had all these like militias in the back country that just fight absolutely brutally. And that's almost like those are like old ethnic resentments that date back to like 16th century Scotland being settled on the American frontier. They, that whole field of you know the war is just, I think, very, very interesting. And I would say, in a certain sense, the war is really won in the South. Because by the later years of the Revolution, the fighting has ground mostly to a halt in the North. After the campaigns where Burgoyne was uh, defeated at Bennington and Saratoga. Well, he won at Bennington, but then lost at Saratoga. And some of the other just things that went wrong for the British in the North, there really wasn't actually that much fighting up there in the later years. But if you look at like South Carolina, for instance, the amount of fighting that took place there is just unbelievable. The amount of battles that took place, especially later in the war. Right. And you have, uh, so a lot of people know sort of like the uh, general American military strategy, which was to win enough battles and stay coherent long enough to have Great Britain's allies sort of just throw everything at us. And then we eventually just overwhelm the British. Um, generally, it, there would be minor alterations and developments here and there, um, especially towards the end. There was sort of a uh, feeling they could just be beaten off the shores. Um and then the British strategy, not many people usually hear about, uh, but it usually ends up turning into something like um, if we just connect with the royalists at home or, or at the colonies, rather, um, our military and their militias can basically just uh, cut the head off the snake and uh, then we can uh, completely uh, dis uh, dissuade anyone from thinking that this is a legitimate government. Um, so... Uh, the, the loyalist holdouts turn out being a, a strategic goal. Yeah, exactly. Really, the general feeling of the British was that this was a very, this was a very limited thing. That like the amount of people who were actually revolutionaries was very small. Right. So, um, it's not the most popular of uh, of wars, at least going by the amount of people that actually participate in it. Um. <laughs> you get the uh uh you get the meme what is it the uh three percent yeah the the classic the classic three percenter meme but i mean yeah. it's true you know the the number of people who are actually involved is uh, statistically pretty small right um and that's that's with a lot of uh especially pre um pre-contemporary revolutions you're not going to have everyone mobilized against the enemy that's a, a very uh new idea so um, that, that's just sort of what you're looking at. And hopefully when you look at this uh, sort of uh, the frontier as well, um, you see a lot of Georgians uh, that will be on the loyalist side. And that's for two reasons. Um, that Georgia um, uh, founding uh, proclamation is very popular amongst the uh, English poor that were there. So that really sort of uh, uh, puts the monarch in a very positive light for a long time, you know, here, here, the, here I am, the great monarch and my royal governor giving you, the poor man, land for yourself. Um, that's a very popular move. Um, and then you also have uh, those frontiersmen in the South didn't tend to be the more extremely uh, independent and rugged uh, uh, Presbyterian character that you would see in the middle colonies. If I remember correctly, most of them would be um, uh, Episcopalian or Church of England. Uh, yes, very much so. Which, which obviously uh, would put them in the uh, in the royalist camp, um, especially in the frontier. You're disconnected from uh, city politics, and city politics is where all these developments were happening. So, in the span of like a decade, um, you have these people uh, trying to proclaim a revolt. The frontier isn't really going to care about that until it comes to their door, and that means that a lot of these people in the southern frontier are going to be loyal to the crown before anything else. So. Um, those are your two sides, basically. Right, precisely. So, um, 
I think uh, we can sort of uh, fast track our way to the Civil War. I don't know quite how much time you have. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we'll we'll briefly touch on you know. There's another there's another great revival period, and this is heralding the end of Presbyterian dominance. You know, the Presbyterians in the wake of the revolution, they get a national government that heavily, heavily reflects them. I mean, to the point that I would, I would say that the American constitutional structure is a Presbyterian mode of government. Well, very obviously. And if you look at the very original, uh, without, uh, uh, organizational amendment, um, right. You see that the limited enfranchised people that were supposed to know what they were doing, you know, the competent people in the uh, country uh, were supposed to elect a governor for their lo local area. And then this governor could then appoint electors and whatnot else, senators. Um, and uh, these electors uh, would then basically select who the president was going to be, um, you know, taking um, advice from votes and all this other stuff and uh, different sorts of political campaigning. Um, and if that sounds familiar, it's because at the beginning we talked about these local congregations would select, uh, you know, various different types of presbyters that would go to a general assembly and the general assembly would then hand back different people to those local congregations and itself be influenced by the, uh, by the local congregations that they're also influencing because this national government would then, um, have a lot of uh, say in the judiciary. Um, it would have a lot of say in the legislative development. Um, so it, it, it is very, very Presbyterian. Indeed it is. So jumping kind of from that, we go to uh, obviously on the frontier, the Presbyterians really fall behind. So their strength is still in the middle colonies and in the South, really is where they draw the vast majority of their churches and their ministers. Right, and uh, as America will develop, um, it should be obvious, this is going to lead to what might be called sectional interests. Um, because there is this localized uh, form of government, uh, different parts of the country are going to develop in different ways, uh, which is going to lead to a divide in the uh, regional uh, character. So. Um, that sort of Southern separatism that you still see to this day is going to come about, uh, a lot of people say, because of the geography and the political economy and whatnot else that lends itself to a more agricultural and uh, plantation style of production, which means that society is going to be based around that because that's its wealth generator, that's where its aristocracy is, that's where its uh, ruling class is from. Whereas the North is going to industrialize faster. Um, and favor more protectionist uh, policies, it's going to, it, what not else, um, because its geography and its political class and its political economy does not lend itself to these uh, land-holding uh, aristocratic classes. It's going to be more of the industrious middle class. Um, religions will develop along the same lines. They will uh, follow these differences. So, um, yeah, even northern and southern like Presbyterianism kind of develop a little bit differently. You know, the Pietism has more influence, a perceived influence at least, in the north than it does in the south among the Presbyterians. You know, southern Presbyterians, both before and after the war, you can kind of tell in some of their writings. I mean, I, at the very least, I picked this up a lot in Dabney, who's the one I've read the most of the sort of like Southern Presbyterian fire eaters, but they basically believe themselves to be the custodians of orthodoxy. Like they're the only ones left. Like even though these Northerners are Presbyterians, like they really can't be relied upon to stick to the scripture. So we're the only ones doing that. Right. And uh, just for our uh, audience that doesn't uh, necessarily know, what is a fire eater? So the fire eaters, it's a specific type of very forceful, you know, perceived fire and brimstone preaching that comes primarily from the South and in the lead up to the Civil War. So after after the 1830s and 40s, this is after the collateralization of the slaves by plantation owners in order to get, you know, the loans for improvement. So slavery in this sense is not only like the mode of being, but it's locked in. And a lot of these these ministers, there's there's a shift you can tell. 
in the 1830s and 1840s from, and it's not just the ministers, but like if you read like a Jefferson, they believe that slavery is dying out. And that, you know, given a couple, you know, maybe a century, maybe less, it will be gone. And they had, I, I would say, a reasonable expectation that that was going to be a case. But between innovations and just various changes to the, to the landscape, such as it was, this was no longer the case. And what you see in the writing is a shift from believing slavery is this sort of necessary evil that we just kind of have to tolerate till it dies out to believing slavery is a positive good in and of itself. That in essence, slavery is a righteous thing to defend. Right. And I'm more familiar with my uh, own denomination's writings on this topic, which falls towards the more this is a righteous thing to defend. Um, but it seems to me that a lot of what the uh, Presbyterians will write at this time is they will go back to, like, Greek etymology in the New Testament. They will go into Old Testament covenant theology and all this other stuff in order to sort of show that this is the natural uh, way of organizing humans, is having yes. slavery. Well, and so they're, they're aided by a couple things. One, they tend to be much better educated as a general rule. I, well, maybe that's not even true. It's not maybe that they're better educated. They just made so much better arguments than their opponents. I mean, if you read a lot of the abolitionist literature, it's very, it's very emotional. It's very, in a certain sense, if you wanted to call it that, manipulative. Uh, you know, of like, a, how could you do this? Like a literal, like, how could you as a good person support this? And the fire eaters... And Presbyterians, they're much more focused on, well, okay, here's Aristotle's quote about natural slavery and just the, as, a, as a reality of human existence. Here's the quotes about slavery in the Bible. Here's the book of Philemon where Paul tells the slave to return to his master. You know, they, they have much more well-thought-out arguments. Right, and if you go to uh, Dabney's sort of defense of slavery, there is a whole chapter dedicated in there to defining specifically what, like, the Greek word in the New Testament for slavery exactly means, um, which, uh, you know, you don't see sort of abolitionists doing that. They will sort of come up, they'll say, well, it, it, sure, it says this, but it, it was practiced slightly differently. They'll, they'll do the, it can't mean that. It couldn't right. have meant that. Right, and, and that's ultimately because all of their appeals go to uh, humanism, is what we would call it theologically. Um, it goes to a sort of a secular uh, human construction of human organization uh, instead of a uh, sort of self-proving uh, organization that uh, the uh, fire eaters would find in scripture only. Um, which, if that sounds similar, uh, you know, appealing to secular humanism over uh, scripture itself, um, this is an argument that will go on forever, basically. So, um, yeah, without, I mean, to, uh, to kind of put a bow on this point, there's a quote that uh, James Henley Thornwell gives at the, at the outset of the Civil War, where he says, quote, The parties in this conflict are not merely abolitionists and slaveholders. They are atheists, socialists, communists, red republicans, Jacobins on the one side, and friends of order and regulated freedom on the other. In one word, the world is a battleground. Christianity and atheism are the combatants, and, progress, and the progress of humanity is at stake. Right. And um, basically, uh, as I said, I'm familiar with the Lutherans on this and that they use basically the same sort of language. Like uh, um, the guy that founded the uh, sort of the, the conservative Lutheran Synod, uh, the Missouri Synod, um, he would he would use the exact same things. He would call them atheists, socialists, communists. He would call them Jacobins and he would call them um, uh, humanists as a very vile insult to him. So, uh, you know, this is a it's not just relegated to Presbyterians, I might uh, tell you. However, for our audience, they are going to be the main vector in a lot of the main research at this point in time. They have the institutions. Um, they have the uh, actual brain power. Um, you know, they, these are, uh, as a demographic, very intelligent people um, and some of the only educated ones in the country at this time, which is why in 1860, you know, their ministers can write books on translating and on uh, the historiosity of Roman slavery and all this other stuff. So... Getting out of all of that, I think it might be wor worth mentioning sort of in the uh, antebellum, um, what were the Presbyterians doing? They were basically running the country on the local level. 
Um, I mentioned at the outset, if you go through a lot of American governors, um, you're going to find a lot of Presbyterians, um, especially uh, at the turn of the century into the 1800s. Um, a lot of the country is going to be led by very, very competent Presbyterians. Um, uh, there's, you, you can talk a lot about their legacies, but uh, just to give a, one example, uh, DeWitt Clinton, uh, New York, uh, was a Presbyterian, very well-known statesman, uh, responsible for the Erie Canal. Uh, these were very industrious and uh, far-planning men, uh, even in their developments, uh, which you can have opinions on. Um, but in the modern day, at least, we don't get things like the Erie Canal anymore. We get uh, short-sighted uh, you know, political engineering. So um, you know, that, that's what they were doing sort of in the antebellum uh, across the country, basically. Uh, it was similar things to that. Yes, they they dominate the state legislatures. They dominate the governor's offices. It's it's just kind of it's something that so naturally favors them. It's almost like it just totally makes sense. Like I want to say, like the, the one of the figures that I had written down here is that uh, when when the Battle of Yorktown happened, all of the colonels in the Continental Army, but one of them were Presbyterian elders, which is just like a staggering figure. And it's something like more than half of the officer class were all Presbyterians. Right. So um, I, I think we've uh, made the point here. They are uh, exactly what they are doing in the country. So um, let's talk a little bit more about those fire eaters and uh, their uh, influence, especially on Southern political economy. Um so just to give a better idea to our audience, um, are these just people on the national scale? Are they church ministers? Uh, wh where are these fire eaters? Where are they speaking? Who are they speaking to? And, uh, you know, give a little bit more for them. Well, they're generally actually going to be on the local level. I mean, you have very notable ones who are going to be, you know, your, your big writers. Uh, and they, they get a lot of, they get a lot of airtime in the history books, but actually, as a general rule, this is very this is a very like bottom up movement of defending slavery this way. This is a very very, I almost in a certain sense like democratic sense of like, no, what we're doing is right. And I mean, I think what you could say as well about it is there's something to be said that the South's development being slightly different than the middle colonies, the West and the North. You know, the, there's almost a implication that you can get from some of the northern writers of like, you're the odd person out. You need to get with the program. And I think for a lot of these people, it's like, no, we we love the civilization that we've built and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. If anything, you're the people who have something wrong with you. And you have as well, I think there's something to be said that the fire eaters are a sort of reaction, certainly on the theological side to a lot of these sort of German German ideas that are coming coming across the Atlantic in terms of theology. I mean, the this period of history, you know, the revolution of 1848 in Germany sends shockwaves throughout Europe, and those shockwaves are starting to reach America. I mean, by the Civil War, they've, in many cases, reached America, even though they won't come in full force till later. And this sort of, like, well, what does scripture really mean? How reliable is it? The Isaac evolution, all this stuff. Like, there, you're starting to get a picture. I, this, the fire eaters and Southerners generally are not completely, like, they're not at all unreasonable to believe that a lot of what they believe and a lot of what they have built is under direct attack from the outside. Right. And in the notes here that you've uh, very kindly shared with me, I can't help but notice a word that outlines what you just described here, specifically uh, Prussianism, uh, because I only ever hear that on one side of the uh, of the uh, sort of spectrum there, not the other. Um, and just to sort of underscore your uh, uh, your point there about German ideals, I will very briefly explain this. Um, you have two things with Prussianism. Uh, one, you have the sort of philosophy that was coming out of Prussia at the time. Um, a lot of people will be very familiar with Kant and all of his uh, influences on Christianity. Um, a lot of your sort of uh, modernists in Christianity will point to him a lot of the time. But you also had another thing, which was the Prussian Union of Churches. 
uh, which was a forceful combination of Calvinism and Lutheranism uh, at the uh, sort of uh, convenience of the Prussian monarchy. Um, I don't like simplified stories because it's not entirely true here, uh, but the sort of uh, the story goes that the Prussian monarch was a Calvinist and his wife was a Lutheran. They wanted to commune together and none of the churches would agree, so that he basically forced a combination. And what this did was it angered uh, all uh, the conservative sides of both Calvinists and the Lutherans, uh, basically just saying they're polluting the faith. Um, so you have this sort of uh, a twofold idea here of extreme rationalism combined with unionism, uh, you know, uh, kind of leading into universalism that will bleed its way into America. Um, and this is also why, say, German Protestantism tended to be much more modern and liberal before everyone else is because of these twofold ideas. Um, and then it's going to make its way over to the Americas, um, as we see later uh, when we start talking about the modernist, uh, the modernist controversy and all this other stuff. Um, but I, I was a, uh, I was very uh, sort of happy to see that because I haven't actually heard, uh, you know, the, the Calvinist side of this uh, of this discussion. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a the thing about the Prussian Union too is like, so imagine that you as like a theology professor are forced to defend this. Like, what is the Prussian Union? Of course, you kind of have to appeal to to a sort of liberal modernism to, like, to make it coherent, because otherwise it totally isn't. Like, Calvinism and Lutheranism, while both being Protestant, like, there is, there is a hard distinction between those two. Right. And trying to, like, mash them together, like, you, you wind up creating this very, like, it, it would be a very schizophrenic thing for and is to someone this day. to try and defend. Yeah, and it is to this day. And, you know, even uh, even in America, you kind of like... So the seminary that starts competing with Princeton in Presbyterian circles is Union Theological Seminary. And as we'll sort of touch on later, when modernism really is fighting within the church here in America in, in Presbyterian circles... It's Union Theological Seminary that's really lined up on the side of, you know, for lack of a better description, the modernists. Right. And, and, and as you just said, purely because they had to. Otherwise, there's no sort of uh, rational basis to have it. Um, uh, so uh, with that, um, so we have uh, differently developing sections of the country, taking with it the different uh, denominations and churches. Um, we have this sort of German ideas bleeding into the country along with a massive wave of immigrants taking it with them. Um, we have uh, these sort of uh, abolitionism versus uh, versus uh, status quo or order, uh, as you might call it, um, sort of uh, vying for control of these churches. All of this is going to culminate into the Civil War, along with the political concerns that go with it as well. Um, well, and there's one that, more point I want, one yeah, more okay. point I right. want to hit on that's very important in the whole like Prussianism theological issues here with the Civil War that kind of makes the slavery issue that that puts it, I believe, that crystallizes the the North South divide on this, particularly in Presbyterian circles, and the South's fears, particularly why the fire eaters go so hard, and that is the principle of higher criticism. And we're going to get to this later. We're going to like to explain it in detail. But very briefly, higher criticism is a different way of reading the Bible that is essentially, it's no longer what is Paul telling me here. It's what is, you know, we're going to analyze the, the context, the social, socioeconomic, political conditions here. So like when Paul says this, it's really a commentary on Paul. It's really like, uh, so the Bible authors, when they say you should support slavery, this is not just a reflection of their own plight and their particular time. And this doesn't apply to us at all. Of course, we think slavery is bad. Of course, the Bible doesn't support slavery. You can kind of see where the argument there, you know, where something like higher criticism winds up being exactly what the North needs in this debate, but just winds up driving the South even further up a wall because you are literally attacking their biblical hermeneutic right and uh i could talk about this for hours so i will very briefly limit myself uh higher criticism can basically be explained it's no longer what is the word of god saying to you the christian it is what is the author of this book saying to his audience 
Um, so Paul right, talking exactly. about women being silent isn't saying that women should be silent because of the order of creation and whatnot else as Christians today. It's Paul talking to the church um, in, uh, in the church uh, in the book of Timothy, um, where he's basically just saying, well, they're uneducated, so they can't speak. That's the rational uh, conclusion of what we can draw here. Uh, that's what was going on in the culture and the time and the political development. Women weren't educated and couldn't read. So, of course, they shouldn't be speaking. So if we just fix that, women can preach. Um, th that, that's, that's, uh, that's your method here. Um, and I've, I'm, I'm still shocked that we were getting into this because I thought this was just... Uh, thought this was just something that uh, those crazy old Lutherans talk about. I didn't realize this was a... Uh, no, no, no. This yeah. is like, this is the strain of Presbyterianism, and it influences particularly, I mean, really the war and then probably the next century afterwards. This is a highly, highly influential fault line that runs through Presbyterianism and the history of the country, really, because of it. Very, this is really interesting to me. And, uh, uh, before we start talking about the war itself and go on from that, um, so right leading up to the war, basically the decade before in the 1850s going into basically 1860 kind of, um, you see a lot of attempts to keep the country together. And one of this was the Crittenden Compromise, uh, which would, if I remember correctly, held that the United States should basically annex the remaining Spanish colonies in the Caribbean and admit them as slave states. Um, and from then on out, there would be a perfect balance of admitted states, slave and free, basically formalized into law. Um, if I'm not mixing up my uh, con uh, compromises and amendments. Um, and Crittenden himself was a Presbyterian. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, you still have Presbyterians right up until the war starts trying to keep the country together, uh, basically in harmony. Um, and basically, and also from a more orthodox Presbyterian perspective. Uh, so he's not necessarily giving in to the abolitionists. Um, but he is saying that we can uh, have a balance here to make sure that one doesn't get the upper hand. Obviously, this would be rejected, um, but it was a uh, it was a very real potential that this could have happened. Uh, so th that was just something that caught my eye when I was uh, doing my uh, read throughs trying to prepare myself for this. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. So um, the Civil War itself, I, it's a it's a, a few years um, and. It's basically just going to be the uh, uh, one side is going to somewhat win over the other, but not entirely. Another side is going to be pushed underground for a while um, afterwards. And during the war itself, there's going to be a couple of developments. You'll have army revivals, especially in the South um, and on AA's stream about evangelicalism. Um, I made this the point uh, where I basically just said this is where the Anglicans start of uh, sort of start blending with the evangelicals. Um, because you have a lot of Anglicans and Church of England types that would uh, take part in these revivals, um, usually just because it's the only thing that you could get when you were when you were in the army uh, for church services, because you're not exactly at home on Sundays to go to church. Um, but, uh, however, I am interested to hear what you have to say, Mr. Brooks, um, about w in the Civil War itself, uh, what happens to Presbyterianism? Well, I mean, it's just yet again another moment where. It's just, it's very, very difficult for Presbyterianism to survive in what you might call, or maybe survive is a bit too extreme, but to thrive in revivalist conditions. I mean, the way that Presbyterianism is, it's just like, it's like the opposite of revivalist Christianity, it, almost as much as it can be while still being pretty doctrinally close. It's just that the expression is so different. And Presbyterianism really, really suffers both during the war and in its immediate in its immediate aftermath. Right, and uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, when I uh, in my town that I grew up in, uh, one of the main churches, like the old grand church, is the Presbyterian Church, very tall, has the uh, very fancy high spire. Um, and as I was growing up, I just thought they they were like a different flavor of like baptist or something uh just because all the presbyterians i knew were basically that unfortunately and i remember the first time that i went in and saw it it was a uh, basically the complete opposite um because you see a sort of holdover from the uh austere conditions of early baptists and uh sort of the early uh dissenters and nonconformists. Uh, a lot of baptist churches will have very plain ceilings very plain walls uh little to no stained glass 
Um, very rarely will they have like a full organ unless you're in the East and they have like the really old Baptist churches. Um, it's going to be very sort of uh, uh, minimal. Uh, whereas the Presbyterian church here is basically the complete opposite. Um, and, you know, it has a lot of similarities with a lot of the uh, uh, Lutheran aesthetics, if you will. Uh, however, you know, no images of Christ or anything like that due to the Calvinist influence. Uh, but you will find, <clears throat> you know, organ stained glass. Uh, you know, the walls will have some sort of like uh, decoration to them uh, that you won't find in the more austere churches. So, um I figured I could just hammer that point home a little bit. Um, yes, in my church, the the church that I that I'm a member of that I attend, very similar situation. It's a Presbyterian church, but plenty of stained glass. Very, I mean, just beautiful woodwork in there, but definitely no icons. Right, and uh, so uh, just to, that's the aesthetic point. Uh, what were they doing in the military by chance? Because that's going to be influential for like the next 40 or so years in the country is, uh, who did what in the military at this time? Uh, so, you know, once go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, so, uh, you know, were the uh, Presbyterians holding military positions? Were they relegated? What's going on? Yeah, they're mostly going to be, you know, in the officer class. Although you have quite a few, they're going to be like lower, generally officer class you know much more um they're going to be representing like majors and captains lieutenants a little bit stuff like that and you had plenty of regular troops that were presbyterians too but you know what the tent revivals do is like if you are a christian and you're not really exposed to pietistic or more evangelical type things like it can actually be very you know very uplifting, very tempting. And even, you know, in the army, you had plenty of Presbyterians who, like, they started out Presbyterian, but they would go to these revivals and they'd wind up, you know, being a Methodist or being a Baptist or being something along those lines by the end of the war. Even in the Confederate army, you had a lot of, I would say, you know, from my initial study, like cross conversions of Presbyterians converting to other denominations. Right, and uh, <laughs> it might be worth explaining, um, just because I, I figured most people would probably know what a revival is, but that's probably something that's a little bit foreign to our, uh, especially my European audience. Uh, could you give a very brief overview of what that is? Because I like, hopefully they yeah. know. But so I, to, by way of contrast, I'm going to say like a Presbyterian service, if you ever attend one, is going to be very, very reverent. Like there is, there is genuinely no clapping. There's not. You sit, you know, you hear, you, you will sing hymns together, you hear the word preach, you'll hear the words of institution, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very, very reverent. And a revival is going to be much more like you're clapping your hands, you're dancing, you're singing around. It's much more like boisterous and much more um, experiential. It's going to be much more a little bit like... I hate to say this because it sounds very, very polemical, and that's not exactly my purpose in saying it, but it's a lot more like a rock concert for what it's worth. Or or at the very least, sort of like a uh, a dancing party that you would find on the yeah. front here at this time. And that would make sense because that's literally what they came out of. So, right, precisely. Um, so uh, you would uh, very often you wouldn't have a dedicated church building. It would be out in the countryside. Um, and this was a... Uh, at this point in time, you know, this isn't like you're taking a camping trip in the modern day. That's going to be uh, painful. Um, you're going to have to live out in the countryside in tents. Um, and that was for twofold reasons. Um, one was because the, they looked back in the Old Testament and that's what the Israelites did. So that's what they're going to do here because it's more authentic. And then the other reason is because that gets you away from what was perceived at the time to be modern luxury and really sort of drive back. Uh, this sort of uh, Christian spirit that the population had lost at this point in time, uh, hence the revival. Uh, you're reviving uh, Christianity into the hearts of people, into the hearts of this population. 
Um, so as a result, much less strict, much less organized. It's going to be much more uh, congregationalist uh, to go back to what we talked about at the beginning. And well, it's, it's fundamentally much... restorationist in character. Right. Like I touched on this in an essay of mine, of basically like a basic distinction within Protestantism. But the idea is we're trying to get as close as we possibly can to the early church with the or like the very, very early church belief. And of course, the early church isn't going to have pretty buildings and the early church isn't going to have these these reverent liturgies. It's just going to, which I mean, whether that's true or not, you know, but it's like the perception of the early church. The perception of the early church is like going to be, you know, make a joyful noise, very singing, boisterous, out, out in the wilderness, so to speak. And that's what they're going for. And so that's what these revivals, you know, both the ones in the army and the previous ones, that's what they're about. Right. And uh, the other thing I was going to say as well is that's also going to put these individual congregations very much under the sway of whoever the revival list is. Um, so you're going to get doctrinal differences by camp, basically. Um, and as communications improve as time goes on, uh, this will coalesce probably into a broader evangelical doctrine. Um, but at this point in time, you're going to see all these different denominations have revivalists in them, and they're going to usually differ from what the Orthodox is. So um, just giving a, a view here of what uh, what was going on in the Confederate and Union armies at the time. Uh, so any other uh, influence on the war, of the war itself on Presbyterianism and on the country? Well, I mean, I think that that more or less covers it as far as Presbyterianism specifically. I mean, I'd say the country as well. Like the war is just really, really hard on it's really, really hard on American Christianity, the way in some ways that World War One was hard on European Christianity. And that's that's a very good analogy, I think, for there. Um and one last thing, um, because and this is probably going to go against what you and I would both tend towards. Um, the South did not have a monopoly on theological conservatism. Uh, I don't think I think that would be fair to say, right? Oh, one hundred percent. You have very like when I talk about like uh, the austere Presbyterian like way of, method of doing things. This very much has a home in the North as much in the South, and you know Princeton is obviously technically a northern institution you know, new jersey being a northern state so you had you had this on both sides of the civil war you know when we talk about the revivals like we're talking about the south specifically but these sort of divides these sort of issues are happening on on both sides of the war and it's america in general experiencing this Right, and it might be even worth saying, if I remember correctly, I believe that uh, McClellan, uh, the northern general, uh, was heavily influenced by Presbyterianism. If I remember correctly, I think it was uh, his mother or his wife or something like that. Yeah, I um, think his wife was Presbyterian. I'd have to double check that. So, um, you know, th this isn't uh, this isn't like the country split in half on denominational lines. It's more that it's split in half on that, uh, basically on theology lines. Uh, so, um Obviously, a lot of people today would be very familiar with the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, this is a uh, product of the Civil War. Uh, the Presbyterians would also, uh, they wouldn't split exactly. I don't think you can find a Southern Presbyterian Church of America. Oh, no, no, they split. They oh, split they? into okay. the Confederate Presbyterian Church of, or the the Presbyterian Church of the Confederate States or something. I forget what the exact name is, but they had an official split. Okay, all right, because I knew that the the Episcopalians did that uh, quite famously because the president of the Confederacy was himself an Episcopalian. Um, and, you know, quite famously, there's a lot of stories there. Uh, when Richmond fell, the last thing that Jefferson Davis supposedly did was go to church. Um, you know, it, different stories along those lines. So uh, the Presbyterians split. What happened there? So, I mean, it was just, it was a very practical split in the sense of, like, disagreements about slavery and literally the war the the presbyterians reunited once the war was over pretty okay. immediately thereafter and uh and uh, we don't spend too long on this because i don't know how much you would know about it but uh, uh what does that look like <laughs> how do they come together at the end of the war do they basically just uh was there like an understanding that like uh, a lot of people have died uh, we can resolve our differences now was it a uh, basically more autonomy? there was no there was no uh reconstruction of the southern presbyterian church it was just we're going to 
readmit their synods and readmit them. And I mean, it had been such a short period of time that actually, you know, reintroduction after that period of like, I think it's only like five or six years was a lot easier than if it had gone for another, even another like 10 years. Right. Which uh, would be a very long split. Um, so, um, I, I think that's pretty well with the Civil War, unless you have anything else there. I think we can kind of start No, that covers the, all uh, my material. All righty. Uh, so one real quick note here. Uh, the Civil War is going to lead to Reconstruction, and this is going to lead to different historical schools and all of that. And a lot of them will find their home in Presbyterianism, uh, which will be important later. Uh, we don't have to really deep dive into this right now, uh, but it's going to be important for later Presbyterian figures. Um, so with that, uh, where would you like to go, Mr. Brooks? Cause we could, uh, start talking about, uh, you know, how, how is the, uh, how is this church, uh, going to be influenced by say the social gospel and all this other stuff coming out of the North, uh, the industrial, uh, sort of, uh, revolution having its impact on the churches is another big thing. Uh, what did you have planned for us? Well, I think we're going to go next. I mean, we've already touched on these issues a little bit, but, the Presbyterian Church is, even now that it's, it's reunited, is facing sort of the full brunt of, of the Prussian Union, of Prussianism, and of theological modernism, introducing really like a fight to the death on some level within the church about even like what does it mean to be Presbyterian? What does it mean to be a Christian even? How are we supposed to read our Bible? These are much like it's a much more fractious issue on some level than even than the civil war than slavery right and obviously we can see it's a much more important and fractious issue because it's still one being fought to this day uh we are basically uh we're entering the point in time where a lot of the things we're going to be talking about are still uh around as a uh, theological uh wars basically um you don't see many people arguing about the great evils of abolitionism or slavery anymore. Well, maybe on that one side, but I don't think it's Christians anymore. Um, you do see a lot of people talking about the uh, how true is the Bible, and you know maybe the Bible is incorrect. Um, what about these sort of uh, established institutions? Uh, what about? I think these might have been. Yeah, see, developed. this is this is exactly what I wanted to hit on. So. We're going to pick the story back up here in 1891 with Charles A. Briggs, who is the head of Union Theological Seminary, and he preaches a sermon in 1891 which states that the Bible contains many errors and therefore cannot be inerrant. That basically like, well, we know the Bible is false because of history, therefore this whole idea of inerrancy is not one that we can support. He preaches this in a sermon. Uh, That's at the very church bold. Attached to, yeah, at the church attached to Union Theological Seminary. And the Presbyterian Church, like this is obviously opening up basically a fault line of civil war. 63 Presbyteries in response right to the General Assembly demanding action. And the, there's sort of like, there's not, it's unclear what exactly is going to happen. But these presbyteries, overwhelmingly from the South, I might add, um, apply all this pressure, and eventually he is denied the chair of Union Theological Seminary, as in the, the Presbyterian Church votes to strip him of that, of that title. So the man's basically ousted. Well, he should be, but Union Theological Seminary goes around the back the the board of regents there at union theological seminary they decide no actually we are going to split off from the presbyterian church and appoint him ourselves to the head of to the head of our seminary so they break off and he's still technically in the church he was just denied the chair and he's still educating people who are going to be Presbyterian ministers at Union Theological Seminary, which is now no longer officially a Presbyterian seminary, but it's still a seminary operating. It's very prestigious. So in response, these 63 Presbyteries at the next, at the next General Assembly, which was held in Portland, Oregon, 
issue something called the Portland Deliverance that makes it a condition that you must affirm the inerrancy of the Bible to be a Presbyterian. So they dragged Charles Briggs back for a heresy trial and officially uh, excommunicate him from the church in 17, or what is this, 1892, I believe, is when he's officially, officially expelled, officially excommunicated. Now, uh, obviously, our uh, audience is going to be drawn to the fact that we have an actual heresy trial being conducted, uh, that the aesthetics around that are obviously just going to be a major hit. Um, but um, this is interesting to me because all of this stuff basically happened uh, with the Lutherans, who I'm obviously a part of, but much later, um, basically going into the next century, uh, taking almost, I believe it would be about 60 or 70 or so years. Um, and this is all happening in the 1890s with the Presbyterians, and I'm wondering if that's because uh, they were harder hit, perhaps, by the sort of Prussian Union, uh, which would be a uh, angle that I just don't know about. Or maybe it's the population size. I don't really know. Well, I would say it's the it's the ideas that are coming out of the you know these Prussian ideas, and then the fact that they are much higher, much more highly educated, just makes them naturally susceptible. Like they're doing all of this, and they are still losing the fundamentalist modernist fight, basically, even with expelling these people, even with all the drastic action they're taking, they are still fundamentally losing. And I just used the word fundamentalist, and I think I want to give a brief overview of that because that's a that's a word that need, that still has a lot of power to our modern, both political and theological conception of the American landscape. And this comes from a series titled "The Fundamentals," which were published by Presbyterian elders from 1910 through 1915, and. They were actually funded by Lyman and Milton Stewart, who were both California oil men and Presbyterians, who just poured money into getting these tracks talking about modernism versus fundamentalism to every church that would take them. Like there's an unbelievable amount of these tracks printed. I, I forget what the number is. It's somewhere in the millions. Three million volumes were distributed in the United States over that five year period. Right. And uh, this is uh, something else I touched on with uh, on the evangelical stream with academic agent. This is really where you sort of, uh, if you want to, this is sort of like the start of the modern era for uh, American Christianity, at least. Um, with the publishing of the fundamentals, you've now basically entrenched both sides. Um, you have one side, who's a little bit older, that will start saying, um, well... You know, maybe the maybe the Bible does have a bunch of errors. Maybe uh, women can preach. Maybe you know there is no such thing as a presence in this uh, in this uh, Lord's Supper. Maybe it's all just uh, a metaphor uh, for some sort of a uh, thing happening at the time in Scripture. Maybe uh, you know we can have all these different sorts of uh, sins that we've been uh, telling people to repent of not actually be considered sins. Maybe homosexuality was just a product of Roman Empire laws or something well, like see, that. Well, see, right, exactly. It's a very, very, like, complicated, intelligent, elaborate way of saying, did God really say? Yeah, right, yeah. So, um, and for people, and we know, we, we have non-Christians here in the audience, did God really say is uh, how the first sin was uh, committed. So, um yeah, yeah exactly. A, so you have these, you have the fundamentalists, and they, the these fundamentalist tracks are targeting two enemies fundamentally: higher criticism and Darwinism. These are the two things that they are hammering against in all of their, in all of their tracks. And there's another guy here, and Princeton, I will say, historically is known as the Orthodox Presbyterian denomination. Like they're the ones who are holding the line. They're the font of a lot of this resistance, aside from it just coming organically from these churches. And their chief advocate, a man named J. Gresham Machen, writes a book that is literally titled Christianity and Liberalism, where he makes the case that liberalism is a rival religion to Christianity. Right, and if you uh, if you remember that quote that Mr. Brooks told us back in the uh, sort of fire eater section of the stream, 
um, sort of viewing liberalism and its uh, uh, sibling ideologies as a rival religion. Um, this isn't just some polemical thing that Mr. Mockin uh, came up with uh, to sort of uh, go against the, uh, the uh, historical criticists. Um, this is an idea that has been brewing basically since uh, these uh, modes of thought had been uh, uh, labeled. So fire eaters talked right. about this. Other denominations talked about this. Uh, other apologists from much earlier eras would rail against this. Uh, so this has been culminating for quite a while. Yeah, it's it's been brewing for some time. And like I, the thing that I appreciate about Machen too is he, he lays it out very simply. I'm going to quote uh, again from the book, actually, Christianity and Liberalism. He says, quote, Christ died. That is history. Christ died for our sins. That is doctrine. Without these two elements joined in an absolutely indissoluble union, there is no Christianity. Right. And if you remember back to what we were talking about earlier, a lot of those modernists were basically just saying, you know, there was no historical Christ. Um, this was all, you know, they, they will eventually go to that. Um, you'll have the most extreme that will say there is no Christ. Um, all these people basically just came up with it, but it's a good way of living, so we'll keep it anyways and try to expound what they really were trying to mean in their more esoteric doctrines. You'll get some that are in the middle that will say, all right, maybe Christ did die. But as we all know now, a resurrection is impossible. Death is final. So, you know, they die, they deny, you know, a second coming. They deny a resurrection. They deny a uh, sort of final judgment. And, but, but they, you know, they'll believe that there was a Christ and that he was a good teacher. And then you'll get the... But it's uh, not... It's, it's a Christ that doesn't require things from them. I mean, what this right, fundamentally exactly. is about is forging a Christianity without Christ. Right, that exactly. That is the fundamental fight here. And I don't like... I, you know, again, I, the purpose of this is history, not polemics per se. But this is like within Presbyterianism itself it's laying the foundation to totally undo Christianity. And so the Presbyterians that are fighting on this front, I mean, these are fights that are still happening today, whether we have a Christianity with Christ or without one. And I think we can see to a certain degree, I mean, I'm generally very skeptical of this thesis, but there is something to be said that our political enemies seek to have a sort of bastardized Christianity without Christ. Right, and uh, you don't even have to, uh, you can make it seem much more believable if perhaps someone in our audience is uh, uh, concerned about sort of like the conspiratorial implications there, God forbid. Um, a lot of these people did just up and say, we only want Christianity for the social utility because it's what's keeping the society together. We don't actually believe in Christ. A lot of these modernists did. Um, and I can't speak for the Presbyterians, obviously, because I'm a... I don't know nearly as much about them as you do. Um, but there's a very famous Lutheran minister uh, from this sort of criticist uh, tradition uh, by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And something that he would oftentimes say in his theological works um, is that, you know, there was no such thing as a resurrection. Scripture was uh, er an error. Um, these things couldn't have happened. But we need to keep Christianity around because it's what our societies are based around. And it's what keeps everyone together. So basically, you know, utilitarianism using Christianity. Um, and, you know, I, I'm i sure Bonhoeffer wasn't, uh, you know, the ultra malicious madman that was trying to find out how best to crumble Christianity and use it for its utility. Uh, you know, I'm sure he probably had some sort of what he thought was a good intention. Um, but this is what they were saying. You know, it's this isn't a conspiracy saying they just wanted to use it. The, all of their writings would point to it, hence calling them a... Uh, and so uh, tying modernism in with utilitarianism. Right, precisely. And bon Bonhoeffer, that's an interesting one, because he is he gets trotted out actually a lot in the last several decades. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, in the wake of the Second World War, and we're not going to dwell on that at all, because my opinions on that, that's a whole other issue. But um, essentially, Hitler replaced Satan in a lot of Christian ethics in the wake of the Second World War. 
And Bonhoeffer is viewed as basically like he has been baptized by a lot of modern American evangelicals as like the guy. This is the example that you follow. But he is exactly guilty of a lot of these ideas that have really undone Christianity. Right. And and it's no wonder uh, he was in the German church in the interwar and the German church in the interwar was the hotbed of uh of uh, this modernism, of this historical criticism. Um, now, this presents an issue for me as a Lutheran, um, because this means that our high church tends to be much more liberal, uh, despite the fact that we had the high church much longer than we had the modernism. Um, but then you have the low church, which tries to get rid of all of the uh, sort of heritage around it, but they also have a more correct view of scripture. So uh, it puts me in a... Uh, in a very difficult uh, situation. And I'm sure it probably does with the Presbyterians too, but I'm sure it's a little bit different. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, it's actually, it's actually quite similar because, you know, there's a lot about the more, the more higher church Presbyterians, even among Presbyterians that I really respect. And there's a lot of ways in which I can see that the fundamentalists, they made mistakes that, that need to be corrected. But it is just at the end of the day, like, one of these sides believes in Jesus Christ and the other one doesn't. And yeah. I mean, I don't, I, you can't escape that on some level. Right. And Especially it's not like when we're it's talking a, about a, like a Christian denomination, you just, you literally can't escape that. Right. And it's not like it's some fight happening in the corner where it's like, oh, this one guy over there believes in Christ. And the other guy over there doesn't. This is happening in basically every denomination. So um, you kind of, you're kind of forced to make allies with people that believe uh, more of the same things with you outside of your denomination, uh, as opposed to the ones that share the same brand name, you know, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist, uh, but just completely deny Christ at all. So, um, right, you, know, you, exactly. you get these interesting dynamics. Yeah, you get very, very strange allegiances. That, that is for certain. <laughs> right. So, um, we should probably hop right back on track, though. Um, so, uh, that's sort of like our modernist and uh, fundamentalist controversy that's still continuing to this day. But what's happening in Presbyterianism as this uh, is uh, is fulmating? So I mentioned already that despite all these heresy trials and such, they are losing. And fundamentally, they lose. I mean, Machen writes Christianity and liberalism in the 1920s. And in 19, or maybe later than that, it might be like 19, mid-1930s. But in 1936, he is defrocked from Princeton, uh, Princeton Theological Seminary because he is sponsoring this organization along with a lot of his friends that is essentially working for the training of truly Orthodox Presbyterian ministers, ministers who are hostile to modernism. And the church basically tells him, no, you're not allowed to do this. You have to resign. He refuses and they kick him out. Like not, not he gets kicked out of Princeton, but he gets kicked out of the Presbyterian Church. And so he founds his own splinter group, which is which survives to this day, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Now that's interesting because the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, uh, <laughs> I remember I brought this up with you once upon a time, or it might have been Sam Batch or someone else, but um, on the outside, um, just because of how crazy things have gotten in the modern day, they look very, very conservative. Um, mm -hmm. but you, uh, you enlightened me that that isn't, you know, it's not necessarily so black and well, white. The difficulty with the, the OPC as it exists now is that first of all, they're a very, very small body. There's about 30,000 members throughout the United States. Um, and secondly, they've kind of swallowed enough of modern politics that they really, really twist themselves in knots over stuff like racism, despite the fact that, like, you're the OPC, like, the people who joined are all, like, hyper-fundamentalists and probably a lot of them, like, Southerners who, uh, who may or may not have read certain forbidden Dixie publications. But, I mean, it's just, like, the leadership of the church is very, very... I mean, they'd be willing to do just about anything to show how not racist they are. And this leads them into a lot of trouble. Yeah, so they're they're basically big R Republicans at this point. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, okay. And, you know, it is a little bit... The thing that to say 
about them as well is that they really have a very I mean, in, in both a good way and a bad way, they have a very different character than you would say of like the Princeton Presbyterians in the sense that like they're all, you know, they're all still holding to that. Their ministers have to be educated, but like the feel is very, very different. Like the feel of Presbyterians because of their demand of education is like this is one of the hyper wasp denominations. Like when you get the image of the guy whose who's face looks like it should be on the dollar bill with the very uh well-kept hair and face and the very nice suit and such to everything it's like this is this is an image that holds true of presbyterians historically but is really not true of the opc and you know it's there are a lot of reasons that you could speculate as to why this is i'm not saying this is a value judgment either like a, whether it's a good or bad thing but the thing about and we'll touch on this with the pca as well the Presbyterians in the modern day, the fundamentalist Presbyterians, wind up looking a lot more like fundamentalists than Presbyterians, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and that makes sense as well, because I see the same things with Lutherans, basically. Um, there, yeah. there are certain kinds that will look more like fundamentalist evangelicals than they will Lutherans. Yeah, there's an old joke about the, uh, the Presbyterian church in America, the PCA, uh, which is the church that uh, I was raised in, and that is basically that every PCA church is 12 Presbyterians and all the rest of them are just Baptists. And the yeah. point is because the actual membership of the PCA, like they have a huge amount of Baptists. You know, they can't be in leadership because of the subscription to the Westminster Confession. But like if you go to the churches, you will get, in many cases, you will get a feel that these are people, these are Baptists who baptize babies. Yeah. 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 And that's the, that's the rhetoric that usually gets pushed. So um, before we move too far into the 1900s, um, I mentioned something earlier that the, uh, the Presbyterians in Princeton uh, doing a lot of uh, historical development, especially on American history, uh, being as it's basically their, uh, their governmental project at this point, um, they would end up being very, uh, influential uh should we say um if you've seen the lost cause stream that i did with uh mr uh christopher sandbach yeah. and russell Berry, as he's talked about on twitter now um a certain president of princeton would go on to become the president of the u.s um and he did a lot of work in sort of a uh, historiography of the civil war and basically their method uh, would be going through, if I remember correctly, going through the Civil War, basically account by account, article by article, journal by journal, and trying to figure out exactly what happened during Reconstruction and the end of the Civil War. Um, You're speaking now of Woodrow Wilson and yes. the Dunning School, which yep. are very, very key to American history, to the study of American history. You know, Woodrow Wilson, uh, President of the United States, uh, his father was one of these fire eaters. His father was a Presbyterian minister who was one of these, like, one of these people, for lack of better description, fomenting civil war, but would say all those things about, you know, what the nor what Northern victory would mean. Right. And Wilson writes a history of the United States, like a whole several volume series, which is actually quite good. I have not read it in full, but I've read a lot of it. And Wilson himself, he's a very interesting person. You know, he comes from much more what you might consider the the higher or more modernist side of the Presbyterian Church. But he's a man who deeply cares about his Bible and is he has a highly devotional life. And, you know, when the more that you study him, the more that I kind of like, I don't know what to make of the guy, because I feel like reading him, I get a very strong sense of a genuine faith in jesus christ not in not in like a vague notion of christianity and not in a social gospel though obviously he's a big supporter of a lot of those ideas did we lose turn up here okay well I think we may have lost him for a second. Anyway, you know, Wilson, he's a big supporter of a lot of these ideas, but he himself cares deeply about Christianity. 
And he fits in very, you know, he's a very interesting figure in American history. I, I have to say, he's one of these guys All right, that, <laughs> okay, we did lose you. I was trying to figure out whether we had or not. Yeah, yeah. So, um, anyways, uh, I keep going from wherever you left off there. Okay, I was just, I, I was just filling air a little bit about Wilson, but you know, he's he's a very interesting figure. His history of the United States, fascinating, and I highly recommend any, particularly any Americans who are interested, to please read it because it's quite good and it's very illuminating to read history that was written before. You, before a lot of these new historical schools came out and before, you know, uh, in a certain sense, like the modern political correctness set in because people are just willing to say stuff that will kind of blow you away. I mean, I'd say in a certain sense that like reading a history of the United States from before a certain era, like you feel it, it feels like history books that are written from any era before that more than it feels like feels close to anything that you'd read in the modern day. And that's kind of, that's just Wilson, the man. The bit about the Dunning School, I think, is in some ways even more important because it pioneers, and I'm sure, you know, uh, Sam Batcher, Russell Berry is much more the expert on this than I am, but I'm sure he said at some point that basically it pioneered the idea of putting primary sources as the gold standard of history, which when you look back on is kind of a very obvious thing to do but was just not the way that history was conducted. Right. And so all these rich records of the Civil War and Reconstruction that we had, these Dunning School historians really dug into the meat of it and were very, very good about documenting what they were saying in great detail. Right, and and this is specifically a Presbyterian thing too. Uh, obviously, yes. Woodrow Wilson would be a major indicator of that. Um, so if you're getting the sense that they are uh, declining maybe in national population, you would be correct. Uh, but their influence and their importance by no means has declined as this time has gone on. Um, no, yeah. they still hold a very, very powerful... I mean, and that even, like, that survives World War II on some level. Because, you know, both uh, both Dwight Eisenhower and yeah. Ronald Reagan convert right. to Presbyterianism either shortly before their presidency or during their presidency. Right, and... Um... And even in the modern day, this still continues on as well. And we'll get to that, though. Um, but um, I'll, if you ever do research on the Reconstruction era of the United States, um, all of those primary sources that you can find are basically preserved because the Dunning School uh, decided they were very useful. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that that's a major everlasting importance there in the uh, field of history. But... Um, I, I do believe that that was all I wanted to really cover there in the middle. Uh, obviously, Wilson's administration was uh, had a lot of Presbyterian influence. I'm um, a lot. Conservative opposition to FDR was also Presbyterian in character. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, a lot of the. Uh, a lot of the conservatives, um, especially on the local level, tended to be Presbyterian instead of, say, uh, Baptist, which is what you usually find now. Uh, Episcopalians were kind of uh, falling by the wayside. Um, so, uh, but maybe I was wrong there. No, no, that's that's quite correct. It's funny if you look at the maps of where the resistance to FDR is. I mean, it's all like basically the wasps it's these last like mugwomp wasp holdouts it's like new england is the one place that's trying that that's resisting on some level and the presbyterians the same way you know on all the local level and all this stuff california is interesting you know you kind of mentioned that a little bit uh california is one of the only western states where there's actually a great deal of presbyterian influence and you know that's true as well and it's just you know sort of same deal as Back in the East, it's like these these highly educated American, like what, what you think of as the wasp is a very, very Presbyterian image, almost in some ways more than it is a Anglican or Episcopal image, although they're obviously a big party of it as well. Oh, yeah. Every time anyone does like an aesthetics post and they put like the wasp football player with the short hair that's fair in color, fair skin, 
you know, a uh, very uh, well-exercised man, probably 19 or 20. It is a Presbyterian usually, and you can still see that to this day if you go inside a Presbyterian church. Um, you know, they are the yes. boss. <laughs> so um, with that, um, I think we're about ready to uh, bring us into the modern day here. Uh, because we start, we, uh, we were talking about the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and its foundation. We sort of backtracked a little bit to the Wilson administration. Um, why don't we bring us up to the modern era real quick? Yes. So now we're at kind of the, what, what is officially called now the PC USA is this body that the Orthodox Presbyterians broke from. And as things go on, they are just continuing to drift leftward and leftward as all their ministers keep going through the seminaries and universities. And, you know, the fact of the matter is they're highly educated and the highly educated class of the United States is drifting leftward from this period of like the 30s through the 60s and 70s. And things just keep getting worse and worse. The PC USA reunites with the Cumberland Presbyterians who had been ordaining women for some time then. And, you know, whether this was now a practice of the, of the PC USA is kind of like, it was kind of a gray area that be caught for the sake of unity. People just sort of like decided they weren't going to talk about, but then the the nail like there's just really an effort on the on behalf of presbyterians that are together to try and hold it together even as they just like drift further and further apart but the thing that breaks the camel's back is the civil rights movement the civil rights movement comes around and the southern churches which obviously are the ones who have held orthodoxy in large part for so long they obviously they see what's coming and they're not really willing to tolerate it and ironically like the civil rights movement itself right in the 60s that's not actually when the split happens but that's when the presbyterian church all the educated classes like all right now we're going to start ordaining women now we're really going to start pushing you know, social gospel and all of these sort of more liberal ideas and so in 1973 John Edward Richards, along with many others, fights to create a new body out of the PCUSA, which will be called the Presbyterian Church in America, or PCA. And Edward, or Richards, rather, he writes a book on like the reasons for the split that I'm going to quote here briefly, because I think it, it's very actually illustrative of even in the 1970s how how much they were still holding on to these ideas that have been fought over for now over a century he says one of the reasons they're splitting is in his words uh the influence of quote the socialists who declare all men are equal therefore there must be a great leveling of all humanity and a oneness from privilege and permission as well as, quote, the racial amalgamist who preaches that all races should be merged into one race and differences erased into oneness. I mean, that sounds like uh, that sounds like something that you'd hear, uh, you know, Stephen Carson and I talking about was, uh, you know, lamenting that happening in the churches. This seems to be a, uh, a, a pattern noticed by many different people all over the place was that, you know, they will subvert a church and try to just completely level everything and all differences. Um, yeah. And what's tragic about it too, is like in this case, you know, Richards and the founders of the PCA, which if you look at the PC USA now, I mean, it's just like whether it could even be called a church is debatable, but in 2016, in the wake of Trump, the PCA issued a bunch of like actual declarations basically lamenting all the founders of their denomination as racist. Well, that's a, that's a depressing note. It was one of the moments of realizing like, well, this may not be where, uh, this may not be where I can stay long-term. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of how I've been with the, uh, Lutheran church, Missouri synod. Cause they've, they basically continually do the same things, but through different back channel measures. And I've had the realization, you know, my children, could probably not be there you know when, yeah. when they're growing up but who knows 
we shall see. Yeah, so I do believe that that's kind of where the uh, story's left off at. Uh, you know, there's no resolution. This stuff is still happening. Yeah, it's still it's still fundamentally a fight. And I mean, you know, Donald Trump, when he became president, I guess, like decided that he was now like an evangelical or one of these like, I guess, non-denominational pietists. But his family is a Presbyterian family. And right, I think there's yeah. a lot to be said that like America's success is in many ways tied to the strength and the being the ability to hold on to these ancient truths of these two old denominations of the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians. And, you know, truth be told, we need, we need a return of that. We need those people to once again, be who they are. Right. And if there are people that are not Presbyterians like me looking in on this, uh, some some might wonder, you know, what does it matter if the Presbyterians are conservative or modernist? And it's really just a question of who would you rather have in your community? Would you rather have the conservative or the uh, the true Presbyterian? Or would you rather have the modernist Presbyterian waving the rainbow flag and the BLM flag? Um, you know, wh which one of these do you want? And then suddenly it becomes a a little bit more obvious uh, why you might want to take a side or, you know. Well, and it's particularly work. complicated because it's like those people are going to be on your city council either way. So it's like, what sort of decisions are they going to be making on the city council? That's the question. Right. right. And, it, and that's not even necessarily only Presbyterians. There are other, uh, we could have done probably something similar on uh, Anglicanism in America because uh, <laughs> their influence only recently dropped off in like the 60s. Um, yeah. And they still have quite a lot of old positions in different cities and the stuff like that. Um, and they also have a very similar thing going on with them. Do you want the conservative ones or do you want the modernist ones? Same thing with the Roman Catholics. They don't split necessarily, but there are very much liberal and conservative Catholics. Um, and I don't think anyone here has the uh, opportunity to perfectly bring about what they want. So it's also a question, which ones do you want? Uh uh, which is which is partly why I'm interested in this, but maybe you would have a different uh, concern here, especially being the especially the Presbyterians are your home denomination. Yeah, I mean, I think I think for Presbyterians particularly, there's like a I, I think an honest assessment would just say like America and Presbyterianism they're so tied in together that like the success of one is tied to the success of the other, the failure of one is tied to the failure of the other, and in this sense, like. Figuring out a solution is pretty pretty important to me. I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not that guy. I am, you know, very interested in the study of history and trying to figure out like how things work and which direction we can go. But, you know, in the end, this is sort of a this is sort of a thing where I have to appeal to providence and hope for both my nation and for my, you know, my specific denomination. All righty. And uh, you have a, a very, very hard hitting quote at the end of these notes yes. here. If you wanted to cap off I'll, that, uh, then we'll hit the chat and the super chats and all that and wrap up. That's all right. I'll leave us with a, uh, a nice palate cleanser. And this quote is from Sir John Skelton. Quote, whatever the cause, the Calvinists were the only fighting Protestants. It was they whose faith gave them the courage to stand up for the Reformation in England, Scotland, France, Holland, they and they only did the work, and but for them the Reformation would have been crushed. If it had not been for Calvinists, Huguenots, Puritans, whatever you like to call them, the Pope and Philip would have won, and we should all either be Papists or Socialists. Man, we, we could dedicate a whole stream to that quote there, uh, but I, I, I think that's a good place to leave off, because I think we're going to hit right nicely at the three hour mark if we finish off uh, Super Chats and all the other discussions here. Uh, anything else you'd like to cover, Mr. Books? No, I think I think that book ends it well. Very good. So um, we had our good friend, uh, the, uh, the Course of Empire was here uh, to uh, say hello to us. Uh, if you're on Telegram, you probably know who he is. Uh, very good to see him here. Uh, oh, I might have lost part of the chat here. So um, I do believe that at the start of the stream, there were a bunch of people saying Merry Christmas and all the other stuff. Um, so I can't pull up the chat now because I uh, lost the internet connection. But uh, yes, Merry Christmas to everyone. 
Um, I, that was a much needed break for me. Uh, and uh, yeah, sorry for canceling that very last stream, which was supposed to be this with uh, also joined with uh, Mr. David Wayne, who couldn't be here today due to work. Um, thank you all for bearing with me and for coming back. Uh, this year is going to be quite the uh, quite the hard hitter, I have a feeling. Um, so yeah, here we have uh, Mr. Matt Cat. Uh, indentured servitude was clearly a form of slavery. Happy to see you back, Ryan. Uh, it's very good to be back. And uh, yes, I agree. Um, and that's a very insidious thing that you see in history books, as they'll say, well, the whites had indentured servitude, which was obviously much better yeah. than the chattel slavery. It's a sanitization. Was, yeah. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I don't think that I have necessarily a moral objection against indentured servitude at all, really. Um, barring, you know, normal things like you don't kill other people or lead them to death, um, which would prohibit a lot of the stuff that they did end up doing. Um, it's just... Uh, if someone wanted to uh, promise basically their service for seven years in exchange for land and guns and all this other stuff in the ideal, that would be fine. It's just, that's not uh, really what was happening, which requires a sort of correction on the part of the law, uh, which didn't end up happening because the Quakers controlled it. So uh, that's, uh, that's what we have there. Uh, the course of empire says it was privateers. So they're legal. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Uh, sounds like Grant is in a Wild West saloon. I can't think of a better Something aesthetic like than this. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Brooks has uh, joined us today from a uh, third-party location. Uh, he is uh, sandbatching uh, the uh, connection here. Uh, yeah, basically, I'm sharing the stream with a bunch of uh, you know a bunch of people ordering their coffee or whatever. Uh, I mean, they're having the the largest injection of knowledge and culture that they've ever had in years. They should be grateful. <laughs> Um, here's a question for you, Mr. Brooks. Uh -huh. um, is Presbyterianism as, so, as associated with Scottish heritage in the U.S. as it is in the U.K.? You know, to be honest, not really. Like, as associated, definitely not. There's right. a lot more English Presbyterianism here. Scots-Irish Presbyterianism here. Now, the thing about the Scots-Irish that's interesting is, like, that basically gets called Irish. Like those people will be like, right. "Oh yeah, I'm Irish." When they're Scots Irish, it is a different, is a different thing. So there's a lot, a lot of it traces back to Scotland. Scotland is the country that originates Presbyterianism, but Presbyterianism in America is much more of a like Anglo and Friends thing, primarily Scottish, but Anglo and Friends than it is, you know, in England where it's much more. It that is the Scottish religion. Right. And um, there's also another thing that uh, whenever your uh, identity is so intertwined with the foundation of the country, you will just start identifying as American and not necessarily the old country right. uh, uh, identities, uh, which is perfectly fine, because at that point, they're not really Scots or English. They are a different form of Anglo, which would be American. Um, and then you also have uh, some holdouts. Um, I remember my music teacher uh, that, you know, taught me to play the trumpet, uh, for the four years that I was at a private school, um, was a Presbyterian woman named Miss Jones, who learned how to play the bagpipes and was at a Presbyterian church in town. So, yeah, you, you get examples like that, but it's not by, by far not the majority or even representative. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, there is, there is holdovers though. Um, it's I definitely would... primarily Scottish. It's just not like to the degree that it is in the UK, it's much right. more general here in America. I have a feeling at this point in time, if you were to convert and start becoming Presbyterian, uh, you would only find out sort of the Scottish influence maybe a couple of years down the line. I doubt it would be as uh, as uh, uh, obvious as it might have been decades ago. Um, That's true as well. So, um, and then... Also, you know, Ulster Scots, um, there's this interesting thing that happens with American genealogy um, where they'll see sort of like, oh, name that is in English that comes from Northern Ireland or Southern Scotland. It must either be Scottish or Irish. And my great grandmother did this um, because they have the surname of uh, Robinson and then Bunt uh, would be the other one. Uh, so her maiden name and her uh, eventual surname. Um and they, it was, they uh, both just said, well, you know, we come from what would have been Presbyterians and uh, Calvinistic Baptists. So, and we have these names. So it must be Northern Ireland and Southern Scotland, Scots, Irish, and Scots. And I went back into the genealogy and it was just Englishmen that were in those areas. 
<laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's the truth of the matter, too, is you get a lot of those people where it's like, no, they're literally just English. They literally just live there. Right, yeah, and that would probably be plantation settlers and whatnot else. Um, but, you know, th there's that that happens as well. You'll get a lot of generalizations in genealogy by uh, inferences and intuition, yeah, which, you know, nothing against that. It's just it might not be the most accurate. Um, so, let me see. Um, it's a lot of good conversation here. I don't know that there was much directed at us here. Um, oh, we have a super chat here from Pensa Parma um, for uh, 35 South African Rand. Uh, let's get this in on time for a change. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you, Mr. Parma. Uh, you're, Merry Christmas uh, as well. Yeah. Prince of Parma is one of our most, one of my most regular donators on here, and I, I really need to find a way to sort of like express gratitude because he's a, uh, he's part of what keeps this going. Um, because uh, there is a point in time where I can no longer justify uh, spending as much time on this as I do, uh, and you know, for making money, uh, just because I am in college and do need money from somewhere, and I do have studies elsewhere, so. Uh, it's the regular donators like Mr. Palmer here that keeps this going. Um, so thank you, sir. Um, how, how was your Christmas, Mr. Brooks? We'll, we'll talk about that. Oh, a little bit. it was fantastic. Very one good. of my favorite Christmases for sure. Very good. Uh, that's a very good. Um, I had a similar thing as well. I feel like it was an optimistic note to end the year on. Well, it's just, it's always not. I mean, it, it was particularly special. This is the first Christmas since I've been married. So it was very oh. special spending it with sort of the combined family yeah that that's fantastic yeah I, I, I would ruminate on that however we do have a ten dollar super chat from mr paul moosefoot can you comment on catholic and presbyterian relations post world war ii uh mr books that's your domain well you know it's interesting i will say like presbyterians uh historically of protestants are probably the most hardline anti-catholics of any denomination like in terms of both like effectiveness and how strongly they feel about it they're the the enemies of rome but you know post-world war ii it's been i mean i'd say it's been a lot it's been a lot more mild you know it's been a lot more uh a lot more subdued a lot of the churches in the last few years the westminster confession of faith it has a portion that literally like and this is the, the confession that presbyterians have to subscribe to it has a portion that literally says the pope is the antichrist like the office of pope is the office of antichrist and in the last several decades most presbyterian churches are taking exception to that Mo like the belief in that is actually very small at right this it's point. been altered yeah, I, like within my church, the way that they do it is like they require subscription for all of their officers. They require subscription to the confession, but they allow you to take exceptions if you state the exceptions and the body decides to receive you. And I'm pretty sure all the elders, but like one of them, take exception to the to the bit about the Pope being the Antichrist. Right, and uh, we have several Roman Catholics in our circles, and most of them are very nice uh, if you get to talking to them. Uh, you know, I, I definitely think that we have the higher end of Catholic population in our groups uh, for the ones that are Catholic. Um, but the thing They're that definitely doesn't... a little bit overrepresented, but they yeah, are. They are yeah. generally pretty nice. Uh, the thing that doesn't do them any favors, however, is the fact that those liberal modernists that we were talking about earlier really like Rome, and they really like being ecumenical with Rome. Um, so the uh, ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the liberal one, and if I remember correctly, I think PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church of the USA, um, has talks open with Rome that they participate in. Yep, uh, that's correct. So, um, and that's, as we mentioned earlier, the modernist impulse with Christianity is to use it for utility, um, which you know, basically just means that Rome is a very prestigious institution. It has a lot of social capital, uh, so we need to have talks with it. Uh, and there's also probably the personal aspects. We're the ones doing the uh, adult discussions with Rome. Look at how civilized and uh, and uh, uh, how moderated we are. Look at how yeah, respectable exactly. we are. Uh, so, and that kind of is now, after a few decades, bleeding into the more conservative churches, unfortunately, um, because it's not like a 
the thing that we're opposing here, you have to keep in mind, regardless of what Grant and I think, what is actually happening right now is not, you know, actually trying to resolve differences of churches or trying to hammer out doctrine. Um, it's a political social ploy trying to uh, build up prestige in these more uh, modernist high church types uh, with sort of the more liberal wing of Rome. Um, basically, the conservatives of all sides are losing and that we're not even getting anything productive out of it. So um, that's uh, Mr. Brooks. I don't know if you've had. Yeah, pretty to much. I, I mean, I, I would second all of that. I would say I like know. most of these talks, like the Church of Sweden is very deep in talks with Rome and like the Church <laughs> of Sweden. It's like, dude, like, <laughs> you know, I don't know what they're discussing, but uh <laughs> So just a side note, I'm not going to ruminate too long on that. My professor is Swedish, um, and I was talking to him about the Church of Sweden, because that's I didn't realize they were still like established. They The way their church functions is they elect uh, political representatives in there, so the Greens and the Socialists can have a coalition over yeah. the Church of Sweden, which Correct. is insane to me. <laughs> like I can, yeah, our church has a... Unfortunately, our church election was uh, was faulty. The Green and Socialist Party is now controlling the church explicitly. Like, yeah, I mean, imagine God. if like uh, if you had Jill Stein as like your local yeah. bishop. Yeah. Uh, and anyways, I, I just I'm still flabbergasted by that. Um, we have the course of uh, the course of empire here, adding a little bit of context. The Royal Pro Proclamation of 1763 uh, that was the forbidding of settling outside the Appalachians. Um, say that the Indians got the land, uh, which the local colonists weren't happy about, uh, as I'm sure no, they many were people. Not. Yeah, basically it was the uh, government saying, uh, that land you just settled rightfully and we approved? Uh, no, uh, that's the Indians now. Uh, yeah, on second thought. <laughs> so, um, we have a, uh, I'm presuming uh, Mr. Carlson, our friend at DC Perspective here, isn't a Calvinist by this comment. Uh, weirdest thing about Calvinists to me is the anti-depicting Jesus belief. So I have heard explanations of that. Uh, obviously, I don't agree with it, being as I'm Lutheran and not Calvinist, but I've, I've, it helps to get the actual perspective out there. So, uh, Mr. Brooks, well, save us okay, the so meming and the Now we're getting into IQ. a little bit. I'll, I'll indulge you a little bit of theological autism here about this. Uh, Presbyterianism itself is not necessarily against the depiction of Jesus, because Jesus Christ took human form when he came to earth. What Presbyterianism is against specifically is using any sort of like icons to worship. So using a likeness of Christ and worshiping I like the, the explanation that people will give is like, oh, I'm worshiping Christ through this. And that's what Presbyterians are very much against. So like in my church, in like the they call it the narthex. But basically, like if you want to say like the lobby, there are several the paintings. entrance of the church. Yeah. yeah, there's several paintings of of Christ and of various things that happened in his early ministry. But there are just there are none in uh, there are none in the sanctuary. And so the, the Presbyterian belief on this generally is, you know, depictions of Christ are fine, but worshiping Christ through those depictions, that's a problem. And depicting any other part of the Trinity is a problem because they did not take human form. When you're depicting Christ, you're depicting him as he came in his human form. If you tried to depict him, like depict his heavenly form, then you're getting into more dangerous territory. And there are Presbyterians who are just against all images whatsoever, but that's a much, much smaller niche of people. Right. So um, I'm going to let that there. Uh, I'm not going to comment one way or the other because we're almost out of time. Uh, but if you're going to have a discussion about this later, uh, take that in and don't resort to the memes or the low IQ discussions or gotchas and all this other stuff. Um, you know, don't, uh, don't waste people's time. Uh, so... That's the uh, that's the full view out there, which I simplified earlier. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Moosefoot. Is Grant at the pub? <laughs> yeah, I'm at the saloon. Yeah, so we have that right there. Uh, we have our good friend DC, DC Perspective uh, once again, except New Jersey was barely a northern state, Grant. Uh, so uh, that's fair. I mean, I, I can I can see where the arguments lie, but you know, north of the Mason Dixon fought for the Union. Uh, I'm going to leave that there. Right. And there's something uh, interesting. Uh, culturally, uh, 
up until very, very recently, you know, states like Maryland and Delaware were considered Southern in their character. Uh, I remember yeah. I had the, uh, and you can say that of New Jersey a little bit. Like the middle colonies are definitely like, because because the idea of the Civil War is like Yankee versus Southern. So it's like this idea of like the Cavalier versus the Puritan, which is not like. So if you're in the middle colonies, it's kind of like, well, which side are you on in that? It's kind of up in the air. You're kind of not really even. So I can understand the people from the middle colonies who identify with the South more than the North on some level. Right, and you can see that with their uh, development, their societal development, because they also had plantation systems and landowners like the deeper South. Uh, but their cash crop tended them towards, uh, uh, well, it was tobacco, obviously, was the main cash crop for a lot of the middle colonies. Um, and that is going to have a very different uh, form of uh, political uh, economy tied with it. Uh, because yeah. with the more cottony cash crop towards the South, um, obviously, the more cost-effective short-term measure is going to be importing slave labor. Uh, with tobacco, it's not nearly as uh, difficult from what I understand, but I'm not a tobacco farmer, so I could be incorrect here. And there's also a more high-class culture behind tobacco. Um, so you're going to have a different kind of human capital involved in uh, producing it and uh, developing it. Um, so... You know, the cotton from the south would be taken textiles up north eventually, and then also to the rest of the Americas, uh, to Europe, um, and it'd be developed elsewhere. The tobacco that we had in the middle colonies would be developed at home, and then, then shipped out elsewhere. So there would be more integration with the other sections of America, and, you know, that, that that's the reason, basically. Uh, the other thing I would say is, like, you know, there weren't really, like, towns in the same way that there are. Certainly not in New England, but even, you know, in the middle colonies. And then in Maryland's defense, I think they tried to vote to secede, but uh, Lincoln arrests the entire state legislature and held them yeah. without trial. So not exactly their fault. Yeah, so uh, that, that's basically the reason there. Um, and, and I just find that interesting because when I was growing up, especially when I was studying American history is like the main thing I was doing for a couple of years. Um, I it, it was very much the impression with me that like, well, everywhere south of like Southern Virginia is Southern and everything north is Northern. And then you look at it more and more and it's like, well, no, culturally it extends much farther northward. I mean, the, uh, the Mason-Dixon line itself is uh, farther north than most people would be willing to say is Southern at this point. So... Uh, just an interesting bit there. Uh, we have uh, twenty five dollars from our friend here. Once uh, th that is a very, very generous donation, sir. Um, and he is saying we will. He will have to rewatch this. He joined late. Very interesting content, and refreshing. Thank you. Uh, that is very high praise, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, you know, hopefully, yeah, thank you much. I'm glad to oh. hear people enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, that that is in no small part thanks to Mr. Brooks here who did the heavy lifting. Uh, with the uh, with the uh, direction and the content of the stream here. So a big thanks to him. And hopefully what I can accomplish this year is having some very uh, refreshing and optimistic but not detached content. So, you know, stuff is, that is still relevant, that is uh, very real still, uh, but that isn't escapism. So um, that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, you know, Presbyterianism, the Presbyterian Church in America, very real, and a lot of Americans would have uh, experience with it. So... That's what we have here. And then right here, uh, we have him once again saying he was psyoped into liking Bonhoeffer for some time before he discovered his actual theological beliefs. And I think that's what many most such people, cases. Yeah, most many, people have Many that. such cases. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Eric, Eric Metaxas, for absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, we have uh, Mr. Paul Moosefoot. Uh, thanks for the show, folks. You're very much welcome. It was a pleasure. Um... And we have a, a couple last questions and a uh, super chat, and then we'll uh, I think we'll cap it off here. Uh, who is that quote at the end attributed to, Mr. Books? Sir John Skelton. Very good. Uh, we have Craig of the Mountains. Thanks for the show. You are very welcome. We have our good friend, uh, Lutheran Templar, Luthimplar, uh, Cringe Walker, as some of us may know him. Five dollars. Thank you very much, sir. Been reading about Iona Abbey. The Bibles they printed undid the Aryan conquest of Europe and restored the faith. Sometimes restoration starts small. And that is very true. And I think that does sort of speak to the uh, uh, sort of underlooked aspects of, uh, say, book printing and uh, publishing and uh, sort of a, uh, you know, book keeping. Keeping knowledge well. alive. Keeping yeah. the esoterica alive, as it were. <laughs> right. And I mean, 
we have a lot of right wing publishers, and it's almost a meme at this point that if you want to get your own special uh, aesthetic out there, you start a publishing house. Um, but that is very important work. Um, because those nice books that we get, and they are pretty high quality coming out of our book or uh, publishing houses. Um, you might think of Antelope Hill, Mystery Grove. Um, was it Arius? Is that who it is? I can't can't quite remember him all the time. Um, you know, all their books are, are being kept alive. They're being taken out. Or some of them have been taken out of print and are now being reintroduced. They're very good work. And as we can see here, if it can bring Christianity back from the brink of uh, Arianism, um, you know, it can probably help us today in slightly less dire circumstances. Um, you know, I don't think we're Indeed. as dire. So, um, and I enjoyed meeting uh, meeting Luther Templar or uh, Cringe Walker, or whatever he goes by, this last year, and hopefully I'll be able to make more meetings this year. But so it's always fun to actually meet in person. I mean, you know, the preservation of knowledge—that's one aspect of it, right? The book collecting, keeping keeping the manuscripts, but it's also, you know, really networking together and meeting and doing this not in, not even necessarily like a political sense, but just, you know, uniting in these shared things that we want to hang on to and we want to pass down to future generations. Right. And uh, the Old Glory Club, which is still uh, doing things and still growing, still developing in its early stages, uh, that's part of what it's also trying to do, um, which um, we have we have plans for this next year. I won't say anything at all as to what exactly they are because I don't want to uh, make promises or have changes or whatnot. Um, but we have a few people lined up, uh, and we also have our own uh, still producing group of uh, of authors. Um, some among us would be Paul Fahrenheit, myself, Stephen Carson, Charlemagne. Um, you know, we're we're actively trying to do this on our own, uh, not by publishing books necessarily, but by sort of uh, either summarizing, pointing people towards, or giving off our own experiences uh, that has to do with sort of this American way of life that is being uh, extinguished at the hands of our enemies. Um, so uh, that's just something to look out for. Um, I should have an article coming up on Monday, I believe, uh, which is continuing the uh, American musical tradition. That started with the psalm chanting that uh, Mr. Brooks tried to introduce to our audience on the uh, Scottish Reformation stream that had a very important part um, in the American colonies, uh, especially with standardizing a uh, worship service. Uh, so, you know, that, that was uh, interesting to research and interesting to publish. Uh, just something to look forward to. There is optimism to be had with our group, uh, not just the Old Glory Club, but the broader sphere. Um, and with that, I do believe that we're ready to wrap up. Oh, wait, $5 in from Cringe Walker here. Um, you should check out the book, or you should check out the Book of Kells sometimes. Uh, it was by far the greatest cultural production of the Dark Ages, penned by Druid converts. I find that very interesting. Uh, just because yeah, I read that much. ages and ages ago. Yeah, and so in my defense, uh, most of the people that I have on here are older than me. So I usually, I'm usually end up saying things like, I need to read this, and they will usually say, oh, I read that a long time ago. I didn't know that we had uh, druids, people that were druids in their own lifetime that had written, you know, literature. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's... Well, I, I feel for you. That book list has got to be brutal. And even <laughs> just keeping up with, like, the book recommendations I received by myself, it's like, geez, man. Yeah, I'm sort of at the uh towards the end of last year because i'm also taking you know like 18 19 hour semesters um i can only do so much and i started just saying you know maybe i don't have to work myself as hard and uh sort of just relax the book reading but uh after having like a couple weeks off uh, i feel kind of re-energized and ready to go again for another couple of months so uh there we go now i uh, that that sounds really interesting the book of kells druid converts to christianity that's uh that's very interesting to me that might dedicate that might have its own stream dedicated to it so uh mr brooks i do believe i have your uh your links in the description but verbally just in case where can people find you and your work and what are you doing well people can find me on uh twitter having somewhat intelligent comments and on my sub stack where hopefully it's more intelligent than my Twitter, but probably a little bit less fun. I've also written for the American Sun, and I have an upcoming upcoming article in the Sunflower Society magazine, which is a magazine put together by a good friend of mine that's 
issuing their second issue in the next, I want to say the next month or so, maybe a little bit more. But he does quarterly releases. So I would recommend everyone uh, check that out particularly. I'll have an article in the, the upcoming winter issue. And yeah, Substack and Twitter is mostly where you can find me. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, you're very welcome. And that uh, our good friends of the Sunflower Society are people to check out. If I remember correctly, I think they're very new. Um, so there's a breath of fresh air and optimism there. Indeed. Um, if you want, if you want optimistic analysis, that's not just like everything's. Uh, if you want a lot of we're so back instead of it's so over, Sunflower Society is the place to go. Right, and also in the last uh, issue that I did read, because um, I do believe they put it up on a, as a PDF. Um, you know, it's not pie in the sky optimism either. It's very real optimism. So, um, yeah, we, we have that breath of fresh air coming out of our, especially our newer, um, contributors to this, uh, to this wider sphere. So thank you very much, Mr. Brooks. This has been very enjoyable and, uh, you hard carried the stream, I have to say. <laughs> well, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. Yes, you're very welcome. And, uh, Hopefully there will be greater collaboration between you, I, and everyone else in the future. Because I, uh, I feel like the uh, two uh, two excursions you've had on here uh, have more than proved your uh, academic and intellectual capacity. So hopefully that well, leads amen to, more to in that. The future. I look forward <laughs> to coming back. Yes. All righty. Have a good uh, rest of your day, everyone. Where I am, it's your afternoon. So have a good rest of the afternoon, and goodbye, everyone. <laughs>